DSP work session, and that'll be followed by a task five residential and open space zoning map hearing. And we are targeting adjournment at 445. Are there any items of interest from commissioners? Fabulous. Your mic. Thank you. So I've been in a, in a couple of meetings um, around the whole smart cities issue. So there's a, uh, a group that's kind of centered around the technology association that's been uh, meeting on smart cities. And now that the city has a, uh, a formal pr proposal into USDOT, we're one of the seven finalist cities for a $40 million grant for a smart cities demonstration project. Uh, there was a meeting today with equity partners uh, about the smart cities application. So I just wanted the commission to be aware that uh, I'm sitting and I'm doing so informally. I'm not the official commission representative, but uh, I'll keep you guys in touch. Joe, you're going to talk about the lobbyist item, right? Because I'll chime in on that a little bit. Are there any other items of interest? Um, if not, oh, Chris oh, has more. Sorry. I, I wrote down a list somewhere, but... I haven't found it. Um, so as I think all of you know, the council is doing their final consideration of comp plan amendments uh, with a hearing uh, Thursday at 2 p.m. and I th or no, Thursday at 6 p.m. and the 20th at 2 p.m. Um, I'm considering writing a letter about the digital inclusion issues, open data and broadband equity. And uh, if any other commissioners are interested in signing on to that letter, uh, please let me know and we can do it together. So, thank you. Stole my thunder, Chris. Um, so, to that point, um, I believe I'm going to be um, kind of just doing a, a quick little intro um, representing the PSC in front of council on Thursday um, at that comp plan hearing. Still working with Susan on that. Um, and then, if there are any other concerns or items that different members are interested in writing letters on, instead of kind of opening up a big debate session here, what we kind of talked about doing is kind of sharing amongst, with maybe with Julie, like I'm thinking about writing this letter and she'll find out if anybody else wants to kind of co-sign. Um, we've got some members that have changed on the commission, so opening it back up for a discussion seems just like we're gonna get into quite a interesting discussion and debate that maybe isn't appropriate. Um, the ones that have come up was the open data ones. Um, another one that's come up is um, industrial lands and golf courses. Uh, and a third one that has kind of come up and percolated for discussion of is the downzoning of East Moreland. And so if there's any other things, maybe just let me know. Um, and if you're interested in kind of co-signing any of those letters, um, let me know and I'll let you know if, if the person who's kind of initiated that discussion is gonna follow through. Can you tell us what the proposed changes are on those? I mean, I know what the downzoning of East Moreland is, but how open data has changed and the second one you mentioned? Joe, Chris? Well, yeah, Chris knows it better than yeah, I, I Yeah, I have a memo on the open data stuff I'll be happy to give you. Okay. And um, on the East Moreland, I, I would uh, sign on, depending on what the letter says, but I have some data that I can also... So I'm not search. sure anybody's yet said I'm going to write a letter. Oh, okay. So just FYI. So if, you, if you're interested in writing a letter, um, let me know. Or if somebody else is going to feel like they want to write a letter, let me know. I'd be interested. Um, and on the golf courses? Um, Joe, you want to explain what's happening on the golf courses and industrial lands? What, the, um, um, just on the letters, uh, on the... Um, um, Broadband open data, uh, Chris has actually been involved with a group of advocates, but the city council m um, amendments sort of are just reducing its emphasis and role in the comp plan. They're being, we're, you know, it's in response to um, part of the arguments we heard from city attorney and the like that it's maybe a stretch too far. Um, and as we're writing these letters, we're writing them as individuals signing on to Thanks letters, for clarifying. not... Um, Planning Commission taking a position because your position's already in the record, so it would really confound the record a bit to have them come back again uh, as a separate Planning and Sustainability Commission opinion. And is the thought that the golf courses are coming out in the current amendment? Oh, the current amendment uh, for the golf courses has, um, you know, I'm uh, the um, 
one of the golf courses out the other golf course in and rezoned. Uh, and it's Broadmoor that is being more aggressively treated because Broadmoor uh, um, owners approached the city and said they're interested in industrial redevelopment. <coughs> and the other golf course was not. So we sort of, uh, in our math, it pretty much nets out um, uh, of that. I think the concern, I'm gonna to try to channel Mike, um, <laughs> was that there's not the same amount of, an, of um, open space or environmentally sensitive land in the trade, and that's concerning. Um, there's a few um, commissioner amendments related to missing middle housing that didn't probably even come to the PSC. I certainly wasn't on it at the time that I will personally support. So if others would like to, so I think I'll write a letter related to that issue and do some testimony. If others would like to sign on that, I just let me know on the side. Is that how this works? It, why don't you let me, Julie or I know, and then we'll make sure that we kind of, just to keep sure it's not, make sure it's not a quorum, we'll kind of funnel it back to you. Okay, great, thanks. Any other items? Okay, with that, Joe. Uh, so I I'm, I'm wanted to let the commission know about a proposed ordinance uh, prepared by the city auditor that's gonna go to city council tomorrow. Um, that's on, that's its purpose is to amend the regulations on lobbying entities and city officials. So it's tightening up uh, rules regarding uh, lobbyists and the role of former city officials and current city officials uh, as a lobbyist or uh, performing like a lobbyist. And there's a provision in the draft uh, ordinance that applies to the to, uh, Portland Development Commission, the Planning and Sustainability Commission, and the Design Commission that uh, uh, is, we've asked to have clarified, but one interpretation of it could make it really difficult for a lot of commissioners who are in industries, especially related to topics that we that are within the purview of the of the comp plan, to um, be clear when they're a commissioner and when they're a lobbyist. So uh, those concerns uh, have been expressed all week, and we've had a back and forth with the city auditor's office to uh, try to clarify things. And um, uh, Chris has actually talked to them directly back and forth. And the decision was to pull that particular provision from the ordinance that's going forward tomorrow uh, in response to these questions and in response to uh, the additional discussion that uh, everyone concluded that uh, this provision requires. Um, and uh, what we're thinking is we could uh, get maybe the auditor's office to come to a um, PSC leadership meeting, so there can be some direct dialogue about what you know the purpose was of this and what the thinking was of this. And uh, I know that the bureau and the city attorney's office, or, or at least our advice, uh, the bureau uh, is prepared to offer up uh, comments and amendments to whatever comes out next. Go ahead, Andre. Um, real quick question: Is the PSC the only commission that's having trouble with this, or is uh, development Commission having trouble in the Design Commission too. Oh no, no. It, yeah, in this ordinance, it refers to the Development Commission and the Design Commission. So they're facing the same sort of uh, issues that uh, the PSC is, and uh, advisory committees are as well because of that finding uh, about the need to disclose. So it's sort of a practice that's evolving across the whole city. Um, and some bureaus are moving on it quicker than others. They're still trying to parse what kind of committee requires the disco disclosure, for instance. Okay. Yeah. So just to clarify, um, I did insert myself in this a little bit because I was part of the original advisory group that helped create the lobbying <clears throat> code more than a decade ago. The, the prohibition here is for any member of this commission or the two other commissions to, uh, to lobby city council for money. Um, and maybe that sounds like nothing we would ever do, but you know, let me just take an example. Uh, since Mike is you know, across the Pacific Ocean and can't hit me, I'll use him as the example. Um, you know, obviously, he has a role here. He also has his role as executive director of the Urban Green Spaces Institute, uh, for which he is compensated. So if he advocates at city council on behalf of urban green spaces, he is potentially meeting the technical definition of lobbying. And what the proposed language would say, essentially, is that Upon joining this commission, 
he would surrender his ability to do that. So he could no longer go in front of council and speak on behalf of urban green spaces, which seems kind of crazy to me. Um, I mean, I can sort of understand the transparency the auditor is aiming at, but um, it's a pretty blunt instrument. And um, I, I made the point to the auditor's office that when the original lobbying regulation was done, there was, in fact, an advisory group that could kind of take language and test it against real world situations. Uh, and they do not appear to have done that in this round of changes. So we're encouraging them to, to kind of go through that exercise and they seem to be receptive. Right, and I mean, for instance, Maggie could be in the same situation if there was an, equ since equity is so much part of our plans now, an equity issue that was being discussed with city council. So there's clarifications here that uh, clearly need to be uh, addressed. Is that it? Okay, next is the consent agenda, consideration of the minutes for March 22nd. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And next, I will um, kind of look to each of you to let me know if there's any conflicts of interest that you'd like to disclose at this time for um, the two hearings on the agenda today, one being the um, street vacation for Southwest Florida Street, west of Southwest 45th, and the second one being for the residential and open space zoning map hearing. Um, if you do have a conflict of interest, you could clarify kind of the conflict for which one of those would be great. I hear silence, so we'll move on, which is great. Okay, so next on the agenda is the hearing for street vacation right away, number 8070, Southwest Florida Street, west of Southwest 45th Avenue. Hello, Lance Lindahl, Peabot Right-of-Way Acquisition. The proposal before you today is to vacate the remaining portion of Southwest Florida Street on the west side of Southwest 45th Avenue. The portion of Southwest Florida Street to the immediate west, as well as a portion of Southwest 46th Avenue nearby, were vacated in March of last year at the request of St. Luke Lutheran Church. The previous vacation has a number of different street and sidewalk improvements that are required as conditions of approval. These improvements uh, will be constructed soon through the local improvement district process. Since that vacation was approved last year, both the residential properties located on Southwest 45th between Southwest Vermont and California streets have changed hands and are now under single ownership. These parcels are being redeveloped and will accommodate higher density residential uses. This new owner has joined the LID and will be funding a number of improvements along both Southwest Vermont and Southwest California. This project's located in the Maplehood Neighborhood Association, and they've taken no formal position on this matter. The neighboring Multnomah Neighborhood Association, however, recommends denial of the vacation due to their opposition to the rezoning redevelopment of the adjoining parcels. Public utilities, city bureaus, and public agencies have been notified of this proposal, and none of them have come back with objections to the vacation moving forward. Uh, in addition, PBOT has expressed some concerns that um, New development in this area um, could trigger uh, improvement of this portion of Southwest Florida Street um, as a part of the permitting process, and that would create a serious safety concern for those uh, traveling on uh, Southwest uh, Vermont as well as Southwest uh, 45th Avenue. Uh, due to the close proximity of a new intersection, to the existing signalized intersection at 45th and Vermont and the Southwest Community Center, which is immediately across the street from it. Um, so consistent with all these findings, I urge you to vote in support of the street vacation. And if you have any questions, I'm available. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, if not, we'll take testimony. If there's anybody who's here that would like to testify, we have one testifier signed up at the moment. If there's anybody else, please fill out a form and bring it here to Julie. Looks like we might have one other. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. I've got three names on this uh, request. It's Jim Winkler, Sean Sullivan, and Armin Quillacy. I'm Jim Winkler. I'll talk on, on our behalf. And, let Sean speak and Jim, you're going to need to turn your mic on for us. Thank you. I'm Jim Winkler. I'd like to speak on our behalf. This is the street to nowhere. We acquired the property from uh, the two adjoining property owners who objected 
to the street vacation simply because they didn't want to support the LID. When we acquired their property, it made some sense to pursue the street vacation because otherwise we have a 150 foot long street to nowhere. And I don't think you can see it, but the dotted line behind the yellow is the area that has been vacated vacated already. So literally, this is a street without any grid connectivity value and would involve some additional cost to improve and be, in my judgment, an egregious waste of public resources. Um, we are, as, as Lance said, fully supportive of the LID, which is either commenced or, will about to, or is about to commence. And uh, that's really our story, street to nowhere. Great. Thank you, Jim. Should I meet you halfway? And Doug Klotz. And I probably should have stated sooner um, that we didn't have any issues. If you could keep it to two minutes, that'd be great. Right. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Doug Klotz. Um, well, as some of you may remember, I did oppose these, the, uh, the larger vacation in that vicinity several years ago. Um, and I'm looking at this point, it may be broken up to the point where maybe it's not worth keeping this little piece. But it's just a, 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 a just wanted to speak about a larger trend. Is, you know, we really need to look a little closer at vacations and where we can get connectivity. Um, I don't think that keeping this piece would end up with any further connectivity unless you know a street is pushed through with a later uh, redevelopment. But I just wanted to make a note of that. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Are there any questions for Doug? Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you very much. The hearing, unless there's anybody else who wants to testify, anybody? Okay, the hearing is now closed. Do we have any additional questions for staff? I have just one question. Um, it, there, I think in our briefing you had said that there's no need to have any kind of um, uh, sidewalk down through their easement for a sidewalk down through there to connect to the other vacation, correct? That's correct, yeah. There's um, a stream area to the immediate west of this proposed vacation area. So again, connectivity would be a real design and permitting challenge. Okay. Yeah. And th there's quite a few um, street and sidewalk improvements being funded by the LID, which are gonna greatly improve the pedestrian situation in this area. Okay, thank you. If there's no, any question, no other questions, does someone wanna make a motion? I move we um, recommend the street vacation. Uh, right away, 8070 Southwest Florida Street, west of Southwest 45th. For, for approval? For approval. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for approval. <laughs> Julie? Oh, sorry. Sure, discussion? Just, just a reminder to speak into the mics. Thanks. Uh, I guess I'm looking for some guidance on formalities here. If, if we're recommending to approve it, do the conditions automatically get covered in that motion? Um, um, I believe the, the conditions are part of uh, the staff report, so that's part of what you're approving. Okay. Yeah. Great. Any other questions, comments? Okay, if not, Julie, let's go. I'm still an eye. <laughs> and you're, I think the mic's off. Bob. Yes. Cartel. Yes. Austin. Yes. Rudd. Yes. Smith. Yes. Feedback. Yes. Talmadge. Yes. Schultz. Yes. And then the motion passes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is a work session for the Task 5 Transportation System Plan.
Okay, go ahead, Denver. Okay, thanks. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, thank you again for having us back for our fourth meeting on the transportation system plan. Stage two proposed draft, this document that we've been bringing to you um, since our, our original meeting on February 9th. So thanks again for all the time that you've spent with us and the, the discussion. <clears throat> thanks to all those uh, who gave public testimony, both here in person and written testimony. Um, so uh, today we are preparing Julia's uh, presentation on the. So um, today we are going to walk through a few slides, um, essentially to take you through some of the proposed amendments uh, that staff has given feedback on. Uh, the, you also have received a, um, a copy today of the um, proposed amendments with staff feedback. Uh, so we will use that memo as we are going through our presentation. Uh, the final slide of our presentation will be um, will include the specific uh, requests for planning com planning and sustainability commission action today. So um, the as I mentioned, we had our initial meeting with you on February 9th. It was a briefing. Um, the original draft was released way back in December, December 18th, and after our first meeting, we had two public hearings. So on March 8th and March 22nd, we had public hearings. We had a number of people show up and give testimony. Um, in addition to the those who came to speak on those dates, we also received nearly 200 pieces of written testimony and more than 100 comments on the MAP app. Um, today, uh, March, uh, sorry, the, um, on 20, March 25th, the public testimony closed. And today, we are here for a work session um, where we will talk through some of the amendments that have been proposed and also um, request that you take action um, in, rec in recommending uh, our proposal to um, city council. So the memo that you have in front of you um, contains three lists. And those are the lists that we're going to use to walk through the work session today. Um, the first list. Um, includes items that staff identified uh, that the PSC could vote on as a package, and that's called the consent list. So the items that are on there um, could be voted on as a package, and um, uh, we would like to know um, if there are items from that list that you want to pull. The second list of items uh, includes those that we think uh, we want to walk through discussion with you. So we have seven items total. So we'll have se you know seven slides, essentially, to cover each of those items and an opportunity for um, discussion. The third list is a, a list where we kept some of the things that were proposed that we um, recommend not changing at this time. Um, and. Uh, delay to a future public process. Um, so that's the no change list. So those are the, the three lists that we have in front of you right now. Um, is there any questions about that? No, I do think um, there's already been a request to pull a couple items from consent, and it was four and seven. Did you get that? Yes, okay. I got that. And we will uh, move those to the discussion list. The first one, number four, relates to Hayden Island. We already have a discussion item for Hayden Island, so we'll just cover those two at the same time. The second item uh, relates to uh, mode share targets, and Peter will cover that before he covers the seventh item, which is on TDM. 
Okay, that looks like Maggie May. Yeah, um, just pull item number three, just a couple of little changes. Okay, and I wanted to pull item four from the no change list, which I had previously communicated to staff. So this pull means it's a route? It means we're going to discuss it. Okay. So, the, it so we actually the notion is it. that the consent list we just adopt as a whole, we're all good with it, and the no change list we're not going to do anything about, we're just going to leave it as it is. So if we want to move any of those to the discussion list, we need to identify them now. Any other items? No, looks looks like we're good there, Denver. So we're pulling from the consent three, four, and seven, and from the no change number four. Okay. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right. So the bulk of our discussion will focus on this discussion list, and we've um, included this in the memo. And for each of these items um, that are on this discussion list, we have seven total. We pulled three, so we'll be discussing three additional items. Um, through our presentation and um, the work session. The list includes, um, uh, number one, objectives um, and glossary changes for autonomous vehicles. Number two, um, traffic diversion on neighborhood greenways. This is an objectives, an addition to an objective. Number three, the Northeast 7th and 9th neighborhood greenways. Um, these. We've heard a lot of testimony on um, the designations of the bicycle classifications for 7th and 9th. Number 4 and 5 and 6 all relate to bicycle classifications as well. Um, there's a major list of major amendments, a list of minor amendments. This number 6 is uh, related to the Hayden Island plan, so we'll cover that. And um, the, the previous item we discussed about removing the bike classification along Hayden Bay and um, the Waterside Marina at that same time. Uh, we will um, cover the mode share targets and, and then move on to the transportation demand management. And we will also cover the classification descriptions um, right, uh, right between, I think, three and four, I think is, is the right time to do that. So for this list, as you can see, this is taken right out of the memo. Um, staff uh, helped to develop th most of the, mostly two options for each of these discussion items, um, sometimes three, uh, in the case of number three. And staff also um, proposes a recommendation on which option that we would suggest to you. And you'll also see in that list that there's um, the final column lists the attachment. So this will show you if there's background materials to reference as we're going through our discussion, you can turn, for example, the first one, autonomous vehicles, you can turn to um, the attachment K. So we will jump right into the first item, unless there are questions. Um, and the first item, um, we wanted to give a little bit of background before we jump into um, uh, the discussion about autonomous vehicles. Um, and Courtney's going to start by explaining um, how we're planning to address um, changes to TSP objectives in stage three, the next stage of the TSP update. Hi, Courtney Duke, Bureau of uh, Transportation. So we made uh, changes to the objectives in stage two, mainly as they related to implementing the comprehensive plan policies that were in the recommended draft that's actually at City Council as we speak. We have a hearing on uh, Thursday night related to that. So we didn't make a lot of other changes to objectives in uh, stage two that were sort of outside implementing uh, new policies that were put into the, the comprehensive plan. We got some recommendations for some additional objectives. I think you got a letter from the Bureau of Environmental Services even uh, related to some objectives in chapter eight, which was the public facilities chapter. And our response to them and in response to most of these other objective changes is to put that in our stage three, which is our next stage of the TSP update that we're um, starting 
eminently as soon as we get through some of these things to be done at about this time next year. And that will be including additional objectives as it relates to possibly the public facilities work that we did with Bureau of Environmental Services, some work that we're doing with uh, Vision Zero, that is some work that we're doing internally, and then also just an additional analysis of the comprehensive plan once it's actually been adopted by council, which we think will be uh, June 15th. So Denver and I and other staff have gone through most of the objectives in the TSP as it is to sort of see, do we have some missing spots, do we not? But we really wanted to focus on implementing the comprehensive plan which was task four in this task five stage two. So we didn't do a full comprehensive change of objectives. So that sort of sets the framework for why we said address in stage three, but Chris wants to talk about talk, doing it now, which is fine. Um, so, that's, so that's what we're looking at. So as a, one of our major scope of work and tasks is again to sort of relook at the work that Denver and I and others have done in you know, there's new stuff going on. There's been things that have happened even since the comprehensive plan um, had been proposed by all of you, both internally at PBOT, externally at the, at the Bureau. You know, we're working um, with the Smart Cities Initiative and a variety of other things that we'll be incorporating into our objectives. Um, the objectives are not um, a part of the city's comprehensive plan right now. They'll be a part of the transportation system plan. So again, we can add additional objectives that we want that don't necessarily only tie into the comprehensive plan. We can have some things that are that we want to do on our own. It can be in the in the objectives as well. So those are things that we'll be looking at as both a part of our internal work and any uh, public involvement that we do related to those. So that's why we have a fairly narrow change to objectives as a part of this stage says the wonky staff person. <laughs> so time for me to comment? Yeah, I, well, maybe before we, we do talk specifically about autonomous vehicles, I just want to orient you to the slides. All of the slides will have same content, essentially where to find the attachment, um, what the options are, and then on it you'll see um, where staff recommends which option. So just so you know, that's there for all of the, the slides that we have. Thanks for making it so clear. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Chris? Okay, so this is my fault. Um, you know, I have been um, sort of growing degree of concern as we went through the comp plan process and then into the TSP that um, autonomous vehicles are going to have a big impact on the city in the 20 year horizon for this plan uh, and wanted to be uh, a little bit aggressive about um, getting out ahead of that. And the way I'd frame this is that the, the leading visionaries sort of see two futures with autonomous vehicles. Um, in one, you have essentially privately owned autonomous cars that you know, are essentially robot chauffeurs. And you know, they could take you to work. And because you, know, you may be sitting in, in the back seat with your laptop or your smartphone, uh, you might tolerate a longer commute distance. And therefore, you might have more sprawl and more congestion. Uh, in some cases, uh, your autonomous uh, chauffeur could be circling around waiting for you while you run an errand, contributing to more VMT, and we could have the, the concept of zero passenger vehicle miles, which is not an appealing one. Um, so that's kind of the, the negative scenario. Uh, the positive scenario is that autonomous vehicles come into play primarily as shared mobility tools. So you know, probably primarily rather than being privately owned, they would be a utility, much like you know, a, a robot taxi or you know, Lyft or Uber without a driver uh, in the front seat. Uh, and you, know, you, would, you would summon a car with your smartphone when you wanted one, and it would take you where you wanted to go. And uh, hopefully, we could make them smart enough to pick up multiple passengers going in the same direction. And we could you know, uh, reduce VMT, increase efficiency per passenger mile, uh, achieve a lot of our comp plan um, directions. So uh, what I did was assemble an, an informal group of people I'll call thought leaders on this topic, uh, including some, some government folks, you know, people like Peter Kuntz, our, our uh, signals engineer for the city, um, some private sector folks who've been thinking about this stuff. I mentioned the Smart Cities group that I'm part of. I tapped some people there, and we kind of kicked around ideas. And the, uh, the objectives language that I submitted as an amendment uh, is basically trying to put a, a stake in the sand saying that, you know, this is what Portland would like the future with autonomous vehicles to look like, and it very much favors that shared mobility model, uh, considers equity, um, you know, 
looks at the other things that you know we want to get out of it as a city, uh, so that as this happens over time, staff has some direction uh, on how to uh, to deal with these as the issue begins to come up, rather than uh, you know starting with the blank slate on policy. We want to want to insert a policy preference for for how we approach these uh, as they occur. Um, there's also some glossary language uh, that helps define some of the terms. Uh, so I, I'm fundamentally in agreement with staff that uh, we should not adopt this into the TSP in stage two simply because it really hasn't had any public outreach behind this thought leader group that, that helped me develop it. Um, so what I would like to do is, is uh, make a little bit more specific uh, motion than the one uh, in the staff uh, table, but essentially similar direction. That motion would be to direct staff to include language substantially similar to the amendment in the stage three discussion draft. And I think staff is okay with that. So that's my motion. I'll second that. Thank you. Discussion? Chris, I apologize if I missed reading your language. <laughs> but uh, what does that do? Does that just say at the, some next level this should be an item for discussion? Or what's, what's the practical consequence of what you're proposing? So, um, Jeff, you recall that anything that comes to this commission goes through several stages. There's a discussion draft, which is the vehicle that staff uses to gather feedback from the public. Staff then turns that into a proposed draft that comes to us, and we do our markup uh, and then produce um, a recommended draft that goes to city council. So this direction is essentially to tell staff, take this, put it in your discussion draft so you go out to, to the public to get input, the public sees this and has a chance to comment on it. So I'm trying to start a conversation. And since I know I'm talking to the expert on this, I'll ask you the question, is this the appropriate vehicle and time and place to do this? I mean, obviously this is a topic that's of interest to lots of people, but is this premature? Is this really the right time to, to gin this up as a very complicated piece of work is struggling to get to a finish line? And I'm just asking it from an objective standpoint. Is there a better place and time to do it? Or you really well, feel? I think what Courtney outlined is that stage three will be where staff is putting forward new objectives. So this, I think, is well-timed and sort of the general package of work that staff will be doing at that time. OK. Great. Andre? Um, my concern is not, I, I mean, I'm all for autonomous vehicles, but it's the shiny new penny in the bucket. And, you know, we've got a lot of people, you know, uh, and big companies throwing a lot of billions of dollars at this problem. But we still have a transit problem, and we still don't have enough money to do the basic transit in the city to deliver underemployed, mm -hmm. unemployed, and women and minorities, uh, low-income individuals. We have parts, 25% of the population does not have proper transit. And we are now putting the shiny penny, and everybody's going to run because it's not in the TSP. It's not a funded project. It's going to win. Who's, who, we don't have enough money, so who are we going to take money from? to fund the shiny penny. And my concern is I, I, I'm all for it, but not, not at the expense of what we've already set our priorities and, and are fairly well set, hopefully, in the TSP going forward. So I, I'm concerned that we increase the level of visibility of something that is neat technology that doesn't deliver on our really fundamental basic objectives of the comp plan in increasing complete neighborhoods transit and walking and sidewalks and it doesn't do that so I'm, I'm um, from my standpoint I'm not supportive because I, I would rather it just it, it's a good idea I'm willing to support it as something we look at but not raise it to a a TSP level because then that means you have to attract, transportation has to attract funding and that there's only so many dollars to go around and the new penny always gets the dollar and the old fashioned, old style pennies don't. I guess I 
just for sake of discussion, would argue it actually could be a very cost-effective solution for a lot of individuals, depending on how it all evolves and gets worked out. I mean, and the goal would be to, instead of ignoring it, the shiny penny, is to making sure the shiny penny hits the goals that you just discussed right. and talked about and, and is there for everybody to take advantage of. And if you don't put it in here and have a discussion on it and have staff work on it, then it might just be the shiny penny for an exclusive few. Um, so generally, I am supportive of it right. for and that I, reason. Yeah, I, I share all your objectives, Andre. Um, and my concern is that if we don't have a city position, this technology will happen to us instead of us using it to shape our goals. And the, the purely private sector models without any city regulation or incentives or whatever uh, could very well be del deleterious to our comp plan objectives. So I mean, in some ways, I see this as a precautionary measure. I think it's probably absolutely correct that um, automated vehicles could cannibalize some transit service. Uh, honestly, not clear to me if that delivers a more or less affordable solution to the people who might be using that service. So I don't, don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we ought to be paying attention to find out. And I think what these objectives will do is make us pay attention. That's my goal. The only issue is when I look at the objectives, it doesn't talk about um, where transportation might look at you know, parts of the city for the individuals that might try to serve. We've laid out very, I think, clear objectives in the, in the TSP around who, serve, who we're looking to serve, how it's going to help a city. And these objectives are more about the actual vehicle mm -hmm. versus okay. the people that potentially could use it. And, and that's the, the problem is if we're vehicle focused, the mm -hmm. Ubers, the Lyfts, the GMs, the Apples and Googles and whatever, the people that are really funding this um, are, are looking at the vehicle and they're looking to augment their, as I understand it, at least their, their models today not at the people we we're looking at the people and saying how do we help a, a 40 mm -hmm. 50 percent of our population in the city of portland and, and that's the problem can Go i speak ahead. to that for a second okay okay so i think um just thinking out loud listening to everything i think um putting it in a, the, your letter or your recommendation to direct us to put something in the next discussion draft and I think you could amend, I'm going to tell you what to do, Vice Chair. <laughs> so you could amend the other Vice Chair's motion to make sure that we have that same conversation that you're saying, that you're talking about, to make sure we're looking at people, how are we looking at transit. I think there could be ways that you craft your letter and your recommendation that highlights the existing language that Chris put in as a starter place, as a placeholder, as a beginning of the conversation. And then, you know, bullet point or highlight, and we can cut and paste from even this conversation, some of the things to make sure that we're looking at. And then I think as we remember from the discussion draft, there's always a commentary page um, on the opposite side of the discussion draft. So even if for some reason we only put in the language that, that Chris has proposed, you know, the commentary could have all of the same discussion, but we could also, again, in your letter or in your recommendation to us, to hear some initial language that Commissioner uh, Smith has brought up, here's some things that Commissioner Baugh and the rest of the commission want to make sure that we look at. Because again, for us, it, although it's not completely new that we're looking at this policy, it is will be the first time we put something in writing that we want to mo move towards. But completely agree that the conversation about people versus the, the automobile, that's exactly why we need to have it in the discussion draft, I think. So we can have that discussion both with all of you and with the public and with the providers and the users. And so, you know, I think we would appreciate having some of that direction and ideas in some sort of letter or recommendation to us to make sure that we capture that. And so when you see it as a discussion draft, if it's not there, or there's still some stuff you want to see, you can call us on that. Thanks, Maggie. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess I, that sounds good. I, I would encourage reaching out to CBOs, of course, involved in this work. And yeah. Um, but I guess my concern is not only, you know, when autonomous vehicles come to Portland, but it's, I think what Andre may have been getting at too, is the study. What will the study of this displace other studies that are already on the docket? 
Uh, I don't think so. I think, um, again, we have objectives as one of our main uh, uh, line items, tasks, in our scope of work that we're, we're scoping right now is looking at objectives and, and additional objectives. And autonomous vehicles was on that from the very beginning, having talked with Chris earlier. Again, Vision Zero work, um, stuff related to stormwater, stuff related to possibly ADA and disabilities, which has come up and some other things. So there's quite a bit of work related to objectives that this would not supersede or take over, I don't think. And again, there's quite a few people internally working on a variety of different things related to autonomous vehicles that we can pull in to help us with this work as well. There's other people in the Bureau that are smarter on this and working on this that I'm not on that can assist us with it and be added to our team. So I don't think so. Any other questions? One quick question. Has anyone in the larger planning bureaucracy actually been contacted by anybody, a technology company, uh, anyone who's working on this issue, just to test the waters with the city, to understand, I mean, is there, are they at that level of evolution that they're starting to reach out to local governments to say, hey, what do you think about this or that? Uh, the only thing I can speak to is I know that, that ODOT Region 1, uh, John Mackler, who's the, the planning manager there, has been working more with, with various companies as well as other researchers around the region and the, and the West, especially the West Coast to sort of see what we're doing. I think the main point that I get from him and his presentations and his conversation is similar to what Chris said is it's not really um, when, it's not really if, but when, mm -hmm. so that we should be ahead of the game and should have either policies in place or, again, Chris probably spoke with, with Peter Kuntz that any um, facilities we're putting in or any kind of signals or lighting to make sure we're not preventing any of that. It doesn't mean we necessarily need to encourage it or make it happen, but to, to not be, um, but it's going to happen, so let's be planning for it. Is, what I've heard from the region right. and the state. But and in I fact, don't know anything locally unless it, Joe or anyone else does, or Chris might know. One of my deliberate goals um, is to get Portland out ahead of ODOT. Yeah. Because I would <laughs> like us to determine you know, our destiny in this area uh, and map it out without you know, kind of letting it trickle down from ODOT because I, you know, I think we have a better idea of what the needs in an urban area are than than ODOT will. So th there's a little bit of gamesmanship here to, to get to the starting line first and uh, make ODOT respond to what we're thinking versus the opposite. Go ahead, Eli. Yeah, I appreciate that Chris brought this up. I wouldn't have thought about this with the TSP, but it's kind of scary to think that you have a lot of little chauffeurs running around, probably owned by affluent members of our community and using the public right of way and public parking spaces. And that's a vision that I, it's a little bit, it could really, I mean, cheap gas, put that together, and that's pretty regressive in terms of our transportation system. So I, I, I don't know exactly what comes out of this, but I'm glad that the process proposed to start. Great, any other comments? If not, should we kind of go around the horn and say whether, because we had a motion and a second. Joe's looking at me like, what are you doing, cat? <laughs> <laughs> Like, can we just kind of do a raise the hand type of thing, or? No, we should vote, I think. It, and then I'd, I'd like to amend his amendment to add what um, Courtney had talked about. Okay, so would you like to amend it, vote and then amend, or? Amend first. Amend first. You, huh? <laughs> Tell us what you'd like to add, I'm all ears. Um, well, I'd like to add that um, we include um, what Courtney said, um, uh, I, I guess um, the discussion of um, location and um, target audience and um, the uh, inclusion of how, how it meets um, the comprehensive plans for complete neighborhoods. Okay. Yes, Michelle. Okay. Michelle. okay. Um, it's been an interesting discussion, and I guess where I am at this point, knowing that that's going to evolve a lot as we learn more, is thinking it's a good idea to start thinking about it, but being concerned about incentives and um, funding priorities. Let I tend at this point more let industry pay for it, but get out of the way of it. Okay. Any other comments? I guess I'll just add that what we're doing here is 
setting it up for us to have another conversation in TSP stage three, you know, for the uh, recommended draft where we can change whatever comes out of the discussion draft and do what we think <laughs> is right. So, yeah, I'm really just trying to start the conversation. So, an amendment's on the floor. <clears throat> If we can get a second, we can vote on. I we had a second. Amendment. Okay, then we can vote on the amendment, and then you vote on it as amended. Okay. So the first amendment is Chris's amendment to um, add Chris's language as a part of stage three. No, we no. need to vote on the secondary okay. amendment first. Oh, no, you get the right. second first. All right. Okay. Yeah. Restate yours, please. Mm -hmm. I don't think I can <laughs> reword it. <laughs> Yes. Perfect. Okay. And let's, it sounds like there's kind of a desire to go around the horn, so let's maybe just do that. So just to clarify, we're doing this in two votes. Yep. The yes. Okay. So yeah. aye on the amendment. Uh, Bob. Aye. Marcel. Aye. 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 Yes. Smith. Yes. Back. Yes. Talmadge. Yes. Aye. That passes. Next one. This is a vote on Chris's amendment. As amended. As amended. As amended. As amended. As amended. Jeez, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we're a team. I know. I appreciate it. It's awesome. So we're going back to the, uh, if we could just put that on the floor and second it again, then we'll vote. Yeah, so my, my motion was to direct staff to include language substantially similar to the amendment in the stage three discussion draft. So that would now also incorporate the points that Andre has added. I'll second that again. <laughs> I have just a very brief comment. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in support of this, and I can understand if I worked in the transportation planning department, this would be a fun project to work on. It's exciting, it's new, <laughs> and I hope that the bookends can be kept, that it doesn't be kind of overwhelm you with a desire to dig in and go real deep. That I think we're just saying, let's start an initial conversation and not, not lose sight of other bigger priorities. So with that, Small caveat, I'll vote aye. Yes. 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 Okay. All right, so item we'll two. move on to item two. Um, and item two uh, is a you can find it on attachment L, and it really is a very simple two-word addition um, to the objective language there. And it relates to the use of traffic diversion on neighborhood greenways. And I'm going to go ahead and use our glossary to describe, again, what neighborhood greenways are for those who aren't familiar with them. Um, it's an extensive network of streets with low volumes of motor vehicle traffic that are prioritized for bicycles and enhanced for pedestrians. That's the abbreviated version, but um, essentially they're um, low traffic streets that are prioritized for, for bicycles. Um, and so the proposal is to add traffic diversion to the objective, and the object objective reads, use traffic calming tools and other available tools um, on neighborhood greenways, that's the simplified version. But in the past, we've kind of used other available tools as a general catch-all that included diversion. Um, but with the proposal, it would be making more explicit the term traffic diversion as a tool um, that should be used on neighborhood greenways. And so the proposal is to add the words, uh, to add traffic diversion where it says use traffic calming tools, traffic diversion, and other available tools on neighborhood greenways. So that's and staff is supportive of that, um, in, in part because it's um, uh, also consistent with new comprehensive plan policy guidance um, about the use of traffic diversion on city greenways. Great. Chris? Um, so just to thread this together, uh, as Denver just pointed out, it, when we were doing the comp plan, uh, I, made, I proposed an amendment and uh, my colleagues uh, supported it, thank you that strengthen the language around diversion. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, staff actually used that for some amendments that are in 
right. parts of the, the TSP we're not discussing because we're all That's in agreement. Yeah. Um, I think this particular one got caught by somebody in the community and then I pulled it out and said, yeah. please put it on the list. So this is actually based on community testimony. But it, you know, it continues the thread that um, as we look at policy 9.6, the, the transportation strategy, you know, we're prioritizing walking, biking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, part of doing that successfully is taming the drive alone cars that are out there clogging the streets. Um, so I think diversion is a very appropriate tool to be achieving that. So you know, that's why I uh, think it's important that we include this. Uh, I also want to set it up a little bit. When we get to you know, item three and seventh and ninth, we're going to find that conversation is all about diversion. Uh, so I wanted to make sure we had this policy discussion before we got into talking about that particular greenway. Yeah, that's right. And, and obviously, I am supportive of the staff recommendation to include it. All right. Any other discussion, Carrot Gary? Yeah, I, I'm just um, curious as to whether there might be an unintended consequence here, and whether you, you feel you really need the authorization to use traffic diversion. I would see it as fitting into other available tools, um, and I'm just wondering if if you might run into a problem in the future where somebody makes the critique that, well, traffic diversion is mentioned, but another tool is not specifically mentioned, therefore you can't use that other tool. Um, is that making sense? Yeah, and I, I, Courtney can follow up if I. Well, I, yeah. I think I'm gonna quote Commissioner Smith from when he asked to have the traffic diversion in there in the policy is that he wanted to be very specific about what that tool was. And I think we would like to continue to have that direction that traffic diversion is a tool to use and there are many other tools as well. And I think that he had made it pretty clear, as did the council, um, or the commission, that's at council now, that to add that in the policy language and the description of what um, a city greenway is. And um, I think you guys had that conversation. And what did you say? If you'd wanted vegetable, you would have said vegetable, but you wanted a broccoli, so you said broccoli. So you um, have a good memory. Yeah, so, um, so I think, I. I understand your your question, but I think to give us that specific direction about traffic diversion would be helpful, and that there are still other tools that we would still be able to use even if we didn't want to use traffic diversion. Okay, so on balance, you see it as more helpful than potentially harmful. Correct. Okay, I thank do. you. <clears throat> Any other questions? If not, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the staff recommendation to include the amendment. Second. Okay, Julie. Aye. 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 Yes. 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 Yes.
uh, in attachment M uh, because that just uh, seems to make sense as uh, having a finer grain network. Um, and then extending the major city bikeway on 9th up to Holman Street because we recognized uh, a lot of the testimony um, really wanted to have this clear part of the network to have a north-south major city bikeway uh, to the east of Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard to complement. There's, there's the Vancouver Williams couplet to the west, but there's nothing uh, to the east, and so we wanted to extend that. And, um, but broadly speaking, we felt it was appropriate at this point in stage two to stay uh, with the recommendation of the bicycle plan that was adopted in 2010, which had it on 9th, and um, that we would need to have a bigger conversation uh, at a, a later public process to, to move the major city bikeway designation. Chris? So I'm going to characterize the current situation and, and my reading of the testimony, and I'll invite staff to correct me if they think I mischaracterize anything. Um, currently, Northeast 7th has uh, a fairly high volume of cut through traffic from people trying to avoid MLK. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. So for the folks testifying in favor of 7th, you know, one objective was to tame some of that traffic, that cut through traffic. Um, I think the other theme that, that I think I read clearly in testimony is, and frankly matches my personal experience, um, Seventh, if you took all the cars away and you had seventh and ninth, seventh would be the better bikeway because it's not interrupted by a park and it has shallower grades. So if you know, all other factors being equal, seventh would be a better street to put a major city bikeway on. Um, the way I read the testimony in opposition was, my God, there's all this cut through traffic on seventh. If you make that a bikeway, it's going to come over to my street. Um, so the problem here is all about cut through traffic and the diversion tools that we use, which is why the last item kind of sets this up. It's will we really have the will to try to tame the cut through traffic with diversion and put it back to MLK where it belongs, recognizing that MLK is in some cases already over capacity, uh, or are we going to sort of live with this level of cut through traffic and go put the bikeway somewhere else because we're afraid to deal with the cut through traffic? Um, you know, I think, that again, going back to policy 9.6, which is my, you know, my new touchstone for everything, uh, is if we're serious about making you know, biking the preferred mode, um, we ought to have the guts to take on the cut through traffic and put it in the right place, which means using diversion and other tools and making sure when we do the diversion plan that we protect the whole neighborhood, not just one street, so that the folks on 8th, you know, who supplied a lot of the testimony against 7th, you know, are taken care of, that they're not made the victims of just moving the traffic. So, um, you know, I think ultimately this is going to get pushed down to a project level decision of what to build out. So um, between the options that, that staff has presented to us, um, you know, I, I almost like option C because it's kind of Solomon splitting the baby and said we're going to make it decide later. And until then, neither of you gets a major city bikeway. Um, but I don't really have strong feelings. What I have strong feelings about is that we really acknowledge that you know, our job in the future is going to be to tame this cut through traffic and put the bikeways where they belong. So uh, I'm not going to make a motion yet. I'm interested to hear what my colleagues think. But that's the way I frame up the situation. And I should have gone over the options. So the options we're showing is option A would be responding to uh, the public testimony asking to um, move the major city bikeway over to 7th, at least as far north as it goes, before cutting over to 9th. Uh, option B, which is what we're recommending, I described earlier. And then option C would be to uh, remove the major city bikeway altogether, leave them both as city bikeways, um, as Chris mentioned, mentioned so that uh, in project design, we would be uh, deciding where it goes. But at this policy level, um, it's really just saying uh, what our intention is as far as the network, um, ultimately, we need a funded project before we can hire a project manager and do the public outreach and figure out uh, if diversion is needed, where it would be needed, how to manage impacts. Um, those aren't things we can figure out at this policy level. Eli? So I appreciate these um, permutations. And I use this bikeway regularly as do some of the other ones in this study. So I've been experimenting the past couple weeks, trying it different ways. And I would say that. Um, Ninth is, that park is a serious diversion for bikes um, on Ninth um, and Irving Park. 
because um, you can't go over it because it's got steep grades. And going around it, you might as well just get off the bikeway entirely and go somewhere else. Um, and so I, I tend to support um, in terms of uh, frame this into motion if I need to. But um, the other reason I like, I think seventh makes sense, is it's already being used. And we have this tradition in Portland where the, the main bike route is one street over from the main arterial. It happens on Ankeny, um, it happens on Clinton, it happens on Holman. I mean, it's all over the place. So um, I think, I think trying to shift it over to ninth means you lose the bikers. Um, and so my inclination is to say, I appreciate the extension going from ninth, um, using ninth to get up to Holman, because it's got better connectivity than seventh. You sort of lose it as you get, there's no street through there. Um, um, so I guess my inclination would be to say, this is the, the street that works. We should, as, as a, when I cycle, my favorite sign is when it says, um, Bicyclists only can go through this area. It makes you feel empowered to be a bicyclist. I mean, oftentimes you don't, um, and that's a, a part of the of a diversion um, theme. And it makes all the difference when you're going north and get to Vancouver Williams, and they actually sort of like you get one of the signs that suddenly it's free sailing. Um, and I, I think this long term seventh should be like that. Um, so um, I guess the motion I would put out there would be to go with option A, except that to switch it over at about Sumner to ninth to connect up to Holman. That would be my proposal for an alternate um, to what's in front of us today. I'll second that. Okay, discussion? So is the staff comment on option A that you thought more public outreach that's right. would be appropriate on that one? Yeah. And that's heard, my concern on that yeah, one. Yeah, and we, we did hear, I think initially, what we heard from the public was primarily from those who were supportive and interested in moving the major city bikeway from 9th to 7th. And then I think once that, once that proposal and word got out, then we heard a lot from others who were concerned about the diversion affecting the um, adjacent streets in, in, in essence. And so we felt um, with our recommendation that it made sense to um, to not change the major city bikeway, um, to have more public process um, and that could happen through a, a future um, update to the bicycle classifications, or it could happen through a, a project, a capital project, when we actually have the opportunity to engage with all of the stakeholders and community. Um, part of the concern is also that um, uh, we don't know that we've heard from all of those who would want to express their, their concerns and, and uh, opinions. So what bad thing happens with C? Well, <laughs> well I'd say, um, with option C, the, the downside would be that without having a major city bikeway, it sort of makes these equivalent to the many, many city bikeways um, all over. And it, it sort of de-emphasizes the whole corridor, um, which staff feel that it's still very important to have a, a major north-south uh, bikeway in this sort of area between MLK and uh, 15th. Where that goes is, is hard to tell at this point. But um, if you did yeah. B. There's no potential for seventh becoming the major city bikeway. Well, I think it would it would come down to that project design level. So, so for example, um, in the previous TSP, the um, there were city bikeways shown for the twenties bikeway. Um, that in project design, the twenties bikeway was went with very different alignments than what the policy said. So it's a little different than uh, street classification for traffic is pretty fixed. When we say that. Uh, uh, district collector will be on 33rd. Uh, it's probably not going to be on any other streets because that's the only major street that goes through. But uh, with these sort of bikeways, there's a lot of flexibility and they can use different streets. So um, the policy in a way, in a way both A and B would be saying we want a major city bikeway somewhere in this 7th, 9th corridor. Um, we can't show a big fat line on the map. We have to pick a street for the TSP. But that's just a provides guidance for implementation. Remind me whether this corridor is in the constrained project list. Yeah, the project list uh, has a. It's called the seventh ninth bikeway. It's a project um, in the constrained list. Okay. And and the project sort of acknowledges that it could take different routes. And Eli, you said so right at Sumner in ninth. That's a park that you can't really take that little. Park is further back. 
Park is. Yeah, the park's right actually. Um, oh, I see. Okay. So I get the, it's mean. Irving Park over there, where um, it, it's, it's a park with a lot of topography. So that's why they went around the park instead of over it, which is. It's about um, a 20 foot rise going through that park. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of have to go around it. Mm -hmm. um, seventh goes right along the, the west edge of it. But then you would still have to, so if, if Seventh was made the, the major city bikeway, you'd still have to take a jog over to, to Ninth again? So I, correct. So either way, you're having to take a jog around um, the block. If you go around the park, you have to go right back to where you started. It's oh, a, see, um, okay. And if you go up Ninth, you're England. And I think that further south, you're more like, what, what's the likely crossing point of the interstate highway? I heard That's, people talk about Seventh, right? There's. It's undecided. We're going to okay. debate that in the Central City Plan. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. I mean, so the, I, the Central I City discussion draft uh, mm -hmm. is out now and is showing it landing at 7 um, mm -hmm. on the north side and um, at a major city bikeway on 7th through the Lloyd District. That's just the discussion draft, so that hasn't um, gone through. We're just processing the public comments for that now. Mm -hmm. So where in here does it state that this is going to go into a project mode and get studied further. Uh, that's just the assumption for any any project. We'll have an alternatives analysis and and um, goes through a project design phase. Because so. it's in the project list as a project. Okay. So is there is in an introduction? That's what I was kind of looking for. To the project list, does it state that the process for these is X, so people can feel like I don't have to die on the sword right now for the location of of where this goes. <laughs> Because I'm, I'm assured and confident that you guys are going to bring it back to me for discussion. Right. So that's actually before city council right now. And okay. they're having a hearing on Thursday to discuss exactly that. Um, so discuss amendments. in that process, so if we undertook the 7th, 9th project, and at that time you felt like you wanted to build on 7th, you need to bring that back to us to amend the classification map? Or how, how what would the process look like at that time? There, um, there are different... All the options that you have for a city bikeway are the same as a major city bikeway. The main distinction between a major city bikeway and a city bikeway is that what we tried to do was have a regular spacing of what we thought would be the higher right. traffic volume bicycle routes. And so what we did was um, essentially say, these are routes where we can anticipate a lot more right. bicycle traffic. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Kat, to your point, they would not come back to us to ask. They'd go build something. Just well, like they built the 20s bikeway, they didn't ask us where it should be. But are they going to go back to the public, That's I right. guess, and yeah, have yeah, a discussion yeah. or work yes. session with them, whether it's us or the people who really live along 7th and 9th and ride along there? There would be public process. And most yes. of our TSP projects are very general in nature. It could say improve a facility for bikes and pedestrians. And with the, with the um, assumption that the design happens when you have a funded project that you can go and, and do public outreach and project development on. So that's kind of how our TSP projects are described. So I'm going to ask one more time. So the public is guaranteed they get to have this discussion with you at a later date. Absolutely. Yes. Whether we do A or B. Right. I mean, I think. Okay. Question. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so we have a motion that was to um, approve moving the major city bike designation to Northeast 7. That's been seconded. With the caveat that it would switch over to 9th when it gets up to about Sumner, say Sumner. Okay. Aye. Aye. Yes. No. Smith? Yes. Talmadge? Yes. Schultz? Yes. Okay. Next item. So this is a set of um, what we're calling major bicycle map amendments, um, sort of sim somewhat similar to the 7th and 9th discussion. We wanted to break that one out because we've got so much testimony on that. but. There was also testimony received on um, some other uh, shifts to the major city bikeways. And so you'll kind of sense a theme here uh, for the staff recommendation is that uh, we felt that when we're changing something from a city bikeway to a major city bikeway, that's a pretty big change. And it signals a higher level of trade-offs. And, um, and that we our main goal 
at this stage of the TSP was to implement, was to incorporate the bike plan uh, recommendations, and that established a network. Uh, one thing that's happened since then is the regional transportation came, plan came out, and uh, they went through a regional active transportation plan process, and they identified uh, a fairly different set of major city bikeways, or the equivalent that they have. And so um, a lot of testimony we got was pointing out in certain cases where we weren't consistent with the RTP and people thought that that was a more appropriate designation. Um, or, or they just didn't reference the RTP and just thought um, these streets should be treated as major city bikeways. Um, one theme was diagonal streets. So uh, Sandy and Foster were mentioned a lot as um, providing more direct access. Um, that's in attachment N. Um, that's number two and four. Um, number one was people mentioning that, um, well, I should say number three was the other one that is um, related to the RTP making Burnside from 41st to, 40, uh, to 71st a major city bikeway. And again, that's um, because it's more direct than what, we, what we're showing now on the uh, Davis-Everett uh, route, neighborhood Greenway route. And then um, number one was the uh, switching from Mason Skidmore to uh, going in Alberta. And that's more because that's a project that we've actually implemented and is very well used, has sees very high ridership. Uh, there's a section of the east end near I-205 that we haven't implemented yet. Um, but a lot of people just thought, um, why not recognize the success of that route um, and the usefulness of it and make that the major city bikeway um, rather than the other route. So we've got the maps um, showing all of those. Um, I should note that Sandy, to be consistent with the RTP, we're showing Sandy just from uh, Hollywood, uh, Broadway and Sandy, out to city limits. Um, the, I think in the RTP process, they had identified the inner Sandy part as being a little less uh, important because there are some um, routes like the Sullivan's Gulch Trail and things like that that provide pretty close parallel access. Um, but it would still be a city bikeway. Um, but our staff recommendation is to, again, do more public process around these. There's, um, these are just the ones that we got the most testimony on, but there's a lot of other uh, inconsistencies with the RTP that we need to work through. And we'd like to be able to defer that to use some staff time to analyze that, see if it works for people, and be able to show it uh, in a draft that goes out to the public. Chris? Um, so a couple of questions. Uh, well, first a statement, then a question. So the frame I was using is civic corridors, because that's a new piece of data. You know, in this comp plan process, we identified civic corridors as you know, some of the places that will have the most intense land use. And it seems to me there's a logical nexus to make sure there's good bicycle access to those places. So that was another lens I used to kind of point at these corridors. Are there other corridors in the regional active transportation plan that might get upgraded to major city bikeway status to conform with that plan, or are these the ones that would come up? Okay, these, these were the ones that we got them, uh, that um, you received a lot of public testimony about, but there are others, um, like uh, Boone's Ferry in Southwest um, to provide a connection mm -hmm. down to Lake Oswego. Um, and I believe um, they had the 20s and the 50s and the 70s uh, greenways hmm. as major city bikeways, whereas we just have the 40s. So they had a little bit more density of okay. major city bikeways in uh, southeast Portland. How about Highway 30 to the north? I don't believe Highway 30 is, but I would, I'd have to check on that. OK. Yeah. Um, so we have a whole set of right. So I guess my next question is, you know, is it sort of inevitable that we will redesignate these to conform to the Regional Active Transportation Plan, or is there some mechanism where we could disagree and do something different, what would that look like? Basically, it's, it's sort of a back and forth iterative process. So uh, we could just decide we want to be consistent with the RTP, and we could conform to that. But the 2018 RTP, that's the next time it will be updated. So we have plenty of time to submit to them our recommendation for what we think, uh, how we think their map should be updated. So it could go either way. We, we could say, please adopt our map. And uh, or we could say we'll adopt your map, or we'll more likely it'll be a mix of the two. And, and stage three is where you're doing that conformance, right? So is 
Is the additional public process we're talking about stage three or could it be later than that? It could be later. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna wait and hear what my fellow commissioners say, but you know, I, I'd be inclined to say that our, our motion says stage three, so we make that horizon definite, but uh, I'm not gonna make a motion until I hear what other people think. Eli? Um, I have a couple of thoughts on this batch. One is, um, I mean, some of the advocacy for the Mason, maybe most of it for the Mason route related to a particular intersection um, where Mason crosses Coley Boulevard, where there was a recent, um, a recent death, homicide. Um, and so I'm hope, I, I support this designation. I should disclose I own property on both the going one and the Mason ones. Um, <laughs> so I don't think I have a bias there, but, um, but I, I wanted to just check with staff to make sure that whether it's a city bikeway or a major city bikeway wouldn't effectively deprioritize an intersection that needs some life safety issues addressed? Yeah, it wouldn't affect that. Um, the Mason Skidmore neighborhood greenway is on the constrained project list okay. um, in the near time frame. So that's, that is considered a high priority, um, as is extending the going Alberta okay. greenway. So again, it's a little more at a higher um, policy level, just saying which one is intended to carry a higher volume right. of bicycles. So it could affect some of the design treatments, mm -hmm. but um, a city bikeway um, certainly would still mean that it's a higher, it's still a higher bikeway classification than for traffic. Um, mm -hmm. So it's okay. making those trade-offs pretty clear. Okay. And I have one other um, question, which I, I didn't catch it until um, yesterday, I guess, was the um, Sandy Boulevard. Um, I know there's a proposal originally to make that into a major city bikeway. Um, I didn't realize that it was just from 42nd out. Um, I, I think that coming from 42nd in to where it joins in with um, the burnt eye couplet um, is a huge, it's a hypotenuse. It's, it's a, I see a lot of bicyclists um, go down it anyway, and it's a very direct route downtown, and the other ways you can get to the same place you're going involve going 1.4 times the distance. Um, so I guess um, I hear what you're saying in terms of the um, consistency with the other plan, but I would propose that that, um, recognizing that it's gonna take a lot of work to make Sandy bike friendly, that's so much a direct route for so many people um, that bringing that all the way into the Burnside couplet would be um, a long-term good vision for mm -hmm. bicycle connectivity to downtown. Okay, go ahead, Katie. So I was just wondering why um, you stop, uh, uh, another kind of thing like Eli, I'm looking at Burnside and Burnside is used a lot in East Portland for bicyclists. It's like, it's the quietest street to go down as a bicyclist. So I'm just wondering why it stopped at 71st. It, and I noticed one testimony said the same thing. It was like, it goes all the way to Gresham. It's great. So this, um, the current map does show a major city bikeway on Burnside east of 71st. Okay, um, I'm seeing like the lighter color, a city bikeway. Okay, no, that's the, um, if you go on the right side of the page, east of 71st. Oh, okay. That's, that's the major city bikeway, and that goes out to East Portland. And okay. It stays a major so city bikeway is... all the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this proposal. So this is for closer in. Yeah, this is a section of Burnside mm -hmm. that currently is uh, four lanes of traffic, no bike lanes, um, but there's been a project on the books uh, in the TSP for quite a while and a lot of advocacy around um, adding bike lanes to that street. And so um, right now people get off of Burnside and use Davis and Everett to right. be able to go west. Oh yeah, yeah. I've done that. It's, yeah, okay, good, thanks. Maggie? Um, so for number four for the Southeast Foster, uh, road. So Foster is going to be downsizing in terms of number of lanes. So would this, would a major bikeway, if for some reason that did not occur in the near future, um, would a major bikeway be safe to, ha to have it on as it currently is yeah, with I think the, the speed? This I'm is sure. also a good illustration for how we do improvements on city bikeways and major city bikeways. Obviously, Foster, where we are um, doing a road diet um, in our proposed design, that's 
that project happened after we made the designation as a city bikeway. So we are willing to make difficult trade-offs on city bikeways as well as major city bikeways. Again, the primary difference is the anticipated uh, volume of traffic and also the connectivity um, uh, citywide. So a lot of times we were looking when we were doing the bike plan about you know, a, a corridor that connects from one end of the city to another. And so it was that sort of thinking and how we were looking at the, the, the spacing and the, the assignment. Yeah, it's worth pointing out the major city bikeway classification is a brand new classification in the stage of the TSP. So we don't have experience yet with what that means for uh, planners and engineers as they implement projects. Um, this will be something in the future that we'll see if that has a big effect on you know, people's decision making. And um, although there, it was adopted by council, and there was an acknowledgement that a good example is Capitol Highway in Southwest which has had a major city bikeway in there through design and project development that is that has been considered um, based on council adopting the Portland bike plan, so. Any other questions, Gary? So, so this kind of brings the ordered list into focus. Um, are you envisioning ultimately um, separated bike lanes on uh, Sandy and Foster? I think the, the project design, you know, process would have to determine that. The major city bikeway can take the form of uh, separated bike lanes, neighborhood greenway. It just depends on the situation. So it's not dictating what's actually done on the street. It's, it's laying a policy for the volume of bicyclists expected to use it. So we might want to have a wider facility, wider bike lanes on a major city bikeway because we just expect more people to use it because it's really direct route. But, so whether um, they're painted or, or physically separated, they would be bigger. So, so the volume is really the issue? Yeah, that's the main thing. Similar to uh, traffic classifications, that's a good way to think about it, is that a major city traffic street, uh, we expect to, they tend to need more lanes or more capacity at signals or longer signal cycles because there's just more people using them because multiple streets are collecting into that major street. So similarly with a major city bikeway, we would be expecting a few cyclists on adjacent city bikeways to be feeding into this uh, larger funnel, if you will. So it would affect, it would tend to affect um, the design in that way. That we might, if for something new like Foster, we might want to make the bike lanes as wide as we can because we expect it to get really high use. Okay. And the staff recommendation is not to include these four changes? Yeah, our recommendation is to defer this to a, a future public process, sort of like we were um, saying earlier, where we would be able to add it to uh, a discussion draft uh, in the future and be able to take public comment on it, because people haven't seen these thick lines on the map yet. And they involve substantial trade-offs on streets like Sandy. And you know, people know that that's, uh, it, the space has to come from somewhere. So it's a pretty big deal. I mean, especially with our freight community. Yeah, we've, we've been asked quite a bit to really look at our classifications and not have too many high classifications on the same street. And that's something we would want to analyze. For a street like Sandy, it's a major city traffic street. It's a major truck street. And this would make it a major city bikeway. So, so, so your preference is to do some more work on this before making the policy change? Yes. Thank you. Chris and then Andre. OK, so I think I'm ready to make a motion. Um, I, I agree with staff that because these are statement changes, they should go through further public process. Uh, but I am impatient to see that happen. So I'm going to make the motion that we uh, direct staff to evaluate the proposed major city bikeway amendments and other major city bikeway testimony for inclusion of recommendations in the stage three TSP. Can you say the discussion draft? Discussion draft, sure. Thank you. Do you have a second? I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you. Chris, can you repeat that, please? Sure. I, I'm moving that we direct staff to uh, take these, um, these proposed amendments uh, and evaluate those and other testimony we received about major city bikeways. Uh, and after that analysis, include recommendations in the stage three discussion draft. OK, so we'll have discussion, but we'll start with Andre. Um, so I would not be in favor of that. Um, I'm in favor of option B, but I don't want to put it in stage three. And 
just speaking to Sandy, 41st out there, you go through a significant Vietnamese um, community that owns a lot of restaurants. And uh, I, I live out there as a disclosure, but talking to those business owners, parking is a significant issue they value as a, for their businesses. And to rush this through in stage three would be, I, I think it just needs a lot of discussion. Um, the freight community, it's now the primary way to get into Portland if you're coming off 205 because 84 is backed up and I'm just too many designations as you indicated might be this one might break so I and just looking at that one much less some of the others um, and as you get further out on Sandy there's other issues that would need to be taken into consideration also so I, I'd, I'd rather we I'm supportive of looking at it but take our time in doing it. So a question for Courtney, do you feel you have time in stage three to adequately study it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate the honesty. It, well, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, I mean, on our initial list of things we were gonna do for stage three, looking at the bike plan and looking at bike classifications was not on it because we felt that we were making those changes now as a part of stage two and implementing the bike plan that has already been adopted and that we would be looking towards the 2018 RTP and any processes after that. I mean, the bike plan is the most up-to-date plan in the in in our system uh, right now, and there are possibly other priorities related to the pedestrian plan and Vision Zero and autonomous vehicles that have been there. So it's not currently on our list of things to do in stage three. So the supervisor is here and can talk to, <laughs> to some of that in terms of staffing at this point, but it hadn't been a part of our um, conversations as of yet. Okay. So I was under the impression that stage three was one of your major steps for conforming with the 2018 RTP. What other steps would exist if they're not stage three? Um, conforming with the, the 2018 RTP. I think we want to try to have the TSP done at this time next year, which is 2017, so that we'll have the changes to any objectives, um, some other street classification changes that we haven't had a chance to look at, such as the emergency response routes um, and other requests, and to sort of and have a new document as well, so that it's all sort of tied up and up to date, so that when we go into the 2018 RTP review, we are as up to date as we can be with what we've addressed and what we've uh, approved to be able to then make those comparisons. <clears throat> That's how I've seen it. I'm Judith Gray with the Bureau of Transportation and Courtney did a good job of explaining what our situation is. I think yeah. we're very interested in responding to your concerns and recommendations. It's difficult for us to take it as a direction right now because we've been adding items to our scope of work um, but we're not adding resources. And so we're going to have to do a balancing. And so I just wanted to reiterate that, uh, what Courtney was saying. Right. So if I withdrew my motion and instead made the same motion saying, uh, in time for the 2018 RTP, would you be comfortable with that? So if my seconder will agree, I will withdraw my motion and make a new motion. I agree. Uh, asking, directing staff to uh, review the uh, proposed major city bikeway amendments and the major city bikeway testimony in time to provide uh, recommendations for uh, our harmonization with the 2018 RTP. Yes. Thank you. I guess I need a new second. I'll second. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, discussion? I think with that, Julie, let's roll. Aye. Bob. No. Lorenzo. Yes. Oxman. Yes. Red. Yes. Smith. Yes. Feedback. Yes. Talmadge. Yes. Yes. Denver, question for you. Sure. Um, Commissioner Talmadge has a time commitment, and so was wondering if we oh, can yeah. take consent item three now. That sounds fine. Perfect. Yes. Which one is that? And is that's that the, no, it's, <laughs> we're yet to hear um, exactly what, what the question is, but. Uh, yeah, um, so let me pull it up. 
So this is in reference to the Portland Bicycle Park. Um, description and objectives. So page seven and page nine in section four. Um, I just wanted to add some more explicit language, um, if we can do that on, um, and apologies for the late notice. I just thought about this uh, last night as I was reviewing it again, but um, more explicit language around targeting low in <clears throat> low income neighborhoods for increased um, bicycle bicycle safety infrastructure and education um, because we have objective 6.23e which is saying you know ensure the health social economic and environmental benefits of bicycling are accessible to, are to all portlanders section four page seven okay um but I, I, I don't think that's, that's, you know, I've seen language elsewhere like um, same, if not more effort provided to low income neighborhoods, right? Or those Portlanders who have historically um, not had as much access to bicycle infrastructure. Um, so if we can put language in there, um, say on objective 6.23a, um, 6.3J, 6.3H, um, or make it much clearer, again, on objective 6.23E, that we will be um, prioritizing low-income neighborhoods and Portlanders who have historically not had access to bike infrastructure. Excuse me, Commissioner. I just want to. So we're talking about consent amendments uh, number three. Right, that she moved to discussion. Right. Yeah. Right. Just checking. I wanted yeah. everyone to track. That's all. Yeah. Thanks. But the objective she's talking about is, it's not shown in our memo. Right. It's because we weren't. Yeah. It's not directly tied. It's right. kind of indirectly tied. Right. So. Right. But it. But we don't. Oh, have I have section now. four. Sorry. Right. Because we weren't going to talk about it. Okay. Which is fine. So it's in the, she's looking at the proposed document, mm -hmm. section four, page seven, just to make sure everybody's there. So, here. talk, okay, so, um, <laughs> so there's a couple things. So we do have some stuff in chapter two, sorry, it's Courtney again. Um, so just process, I'm sorry, I'm speaking out loud while I'm talking here, but so process wise for today, if we were to do that, we would have to have the exact language that you want to approve okay. today, um, which, or I'm looking at all of you, we continue the work session to some other time and not take a vote, which probably isn't fair. But that's, that's your, <laughs> it's your decision. So I think as staff, having just heard this now, I think we are supportive of these ideas and having additional conversation and language about um, underserved areas. You know, there are sections of both the TSP and the comp plan where we have those that I guess I'd want to look at with you or with others to see if that covers some of these same issues. It doesn't mean we can't have them again here. And mm -hmm. um, we've done that in other parts of the TSP and the comp plan where we've reiterated those issues. So, um, so I think my general answer is those are good ideas, and I think we're supportive of that idea. If you were to decide that today, we would need to write it as we speak and put it in, again, not having public input or public review about it. But again, pos positive support of, those, of that idea and those conversations, um, and that is something that we can also then, in stage three, be looking at our pedestrian policies and objectives to see if there's anything in those descriptions we want to do with that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, there are additional accessibility and um, equitable policies in the comp plan in chapter nine, chapter two, and chapter eight that you all approved that, you know, we as a bureau have to follow as well. So again, sort of saying, do we need to put it specifically in here, or are there enough other places? Again, if you feel that it still needs to be in here, that's something we can work on. So that's, does that make sense what I said? Okay. So um, process-wise. <laughs> um, Thank you. The, um, um, Courtney described it right, that um, 
we'd have to come back, couldn't necessarily adopt it today as uh, an amendment to be incorporated. Um, I believe we could vote um, sort of to include the gist of the recommendation, Commissioner, in your all's recommendation letter. And right. then what we would have to do is between now and City Council draft language, and we would find a city council member to introduce it after the hearing, but it'd sort of be on the table so everybody could talk about it, but uh, it won't be an official uh, amendment. And I believe that we can for sure get a city council member to add it to the package or in, for just discussion, even if um, you know there wasn't three votes for it. I'm fine with that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so um, probably need to have a discussion to make sure that um, you hear if there's other people that are supportive of that before we kind of move on from that. So why don't we go ahead and just kind of, is there any concerns about Maggie's proposal or, or additional support? Okay. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, I, I appreciate you um, bringing up those issues and um, the I, mic. I thought it was on. Um, I appreciate your bringing up those issues, and I, I support what you're um, you're going for there. And um, I think that uh, it you know if it, if it gave East Portland, which is generally tends to be one of the areas where um, it's harder to put in um, bike uh, facilities, but it's needed probably more than anywhere else in the city. And um, so I, I'm very supportive of that. Chris. And I'm certainly supportive of the concept. I, you know, staff will wind up doing the work to make sure we haven't set it somewhere else already. So um, yeah, as, as long as that process is thorough, I'm, I'm good. Eli? I'm, I'm trying to track this. I'm looking at section six in the TSP in the last objective 6.2. Section four. Section four. OK, that's why I'm finding you here, but not <laughs> looking at four. Then I'm, I'm on the same page. Great. Any other comments, questions? Um, just a brief one, I think it's on, on page nine, uh, similar when you talk about, about bike sharing. Yeah. So applying the same principles there. Okay, so it sounds like, and maybe just let's kind of do a, is, is, are people generally in favor of trying to get language and they can work with you specifically, Maggie, in the letter um, as a recommendation? Because I certainly am supportive. <laughs> Can I make yes. one comment here? Yeah. Can I read something and just say this with the language we want? It, that I, it says in, in this other section, ensure on um, 6.23e, ensure that the health, social, economic, and environmental benefits of bicycling are accessible to all Portlanders, regardless of race, ethnicity, age, economic status, geographic location, or language spoken. Is it? Is it? So maybe if if you want something different, maybe we can give. I'm happy to give direction in a letter to do something more customized, but that's something that's in there. Yeah, I thought it could be taken a little bit further um, rather than just accessible for all, but really targeting um, areas and neighborhoods that have had less access. So projects would be um, prioritized and education efforts would be prioritized in those areas. Michelle? I would just say that I, I'm supportive of that, but again, the emphasis on checking to see if it's already stated. The risk here is that if you call it out here and say, especially East Portland, that somebody could argue somewhere else in the comp plan, well, you didn't elevate it there. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure that ensuring it for all Portland there's, doesn't get us there. And I would just double check and see if there is some blanket language that already talks about investing mm -hmm. in areas that have traditionally received less investment. OK. I believe we have consensus. One, two, I didn't necessarily see anything from Jeff. Three, four, five, six, seven. So I think we have consensus to get something into the letter. Great, thank you. Um, so with that, I think my gut is item three needs to move back up into consent because it really wasn't addressed as right. part of this discussion. Do we all agree with that? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, we'll add this to the letter. Okay. And then we'll take on the next discussion item. Which 
um, kind of carries. I, think I leave now. Wait, one more. Oh, one more. Okay. Uh, which is kind of a con continuation of. Uh, excuse me. Which is a continuation of the um, the bicycle classification map amendments. Yeah. So these are what we're calling minor bicycle map amendments, and this was testimony we we received that was uh, of a smaller scale, usually smaller segments of streets. Um, all of them are just uh, city bikeways rather than major city bikeways. And it just seemed like pretty reasonable suggestions for um, filling in gaps in the network um, where the bicycle plan you know, may have missed uh, certain things and, and uh, advocates have noticed that. And then some of, the, um, some of the list is just technical corrections based on projects we've already built. So uh, it's a mix of just corrections and bigger changes, and it's attachment O. Um, I'll just walk you through them really quickly. So number one is just um, a little extension of a city bikeway to connect to um, Cully Park. And so this was testimony we, we received from uh, people in Cully and Verde, um, pointing out that there's going to be a second entrance to the park eventually, and uh, we should ha really have a city bikeway going there. Uh, number two was making the city bikeway match a project that we recently implemented on Sacramento Street. Uh, number three was um, taking into account a, a, an upcoming project to extend Northwest 20th Avenue underneath Highway 30 um, and creating bicycle connections there, uh, and also uh, adding another bikeway on 22nd Avenue in Northwest. Um, and that, again, was really filling in a gap in the network um, where some bikeways were just stopping um, without connecting to anything. Um, number four is sort of a set of city bikeways uh, between Gleason and Halsey um, in sort of the North Tabor and Laurelhurst areas. And it's basically providing an east-west uh, mobility option using local streets um, as opposed to the major streets, which are classified as city bikeways, but people recognize they might not actually get bike lanes for quite a while. Um, number five was 45th Avenue uh, in Southeast. It's a quiet local street, that's, but that's very direct. Um, so it would provide a really direct north-south option, um, and staff was comfortable with that. Uh, number six was uh, Harrison Street from 12th to Ladd, and that's really connecting to a planned um, bike route that came out of the Southeast Quadrant planning process. Um, so be consistent with the Central City discussion draft. And then number seven um, was just a correction. People pointed out that one of our TSP projects, uh, the I-405 path, was missing a section in the classification map. So just correcting that. And our staff recommendation is to amend them as shown, uh, option A. Chris? So close. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to ask for one more block, and that's on 22nd and Northwest. I'd like you to add four more little green dots. I know you have a tight budget, but I think you can afford four <laughs> little dots to get over to the existing facility on Everett. So if, if, if that's acceptable, then I will move uh, the staff recommendation with the addition of the extension to Everett on Northwest 22nd. To move it where, I'm sorry? To connect this over to Everett right here. Mm. Where is sure, I'm moving. Uh, essentially the whole of item five uh, with the staff recommendation option A to amend the classifications with the one addition of extending the line on Northwest 22nd to the south to Everett. I second, like second that, one? I live there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, discussion? No discussion? Great. Julie, let's roll. Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 All right. So the next item is the Hayden Island pathway. And in this, we'll also discuss um, the item that we pulled from the consent agenda, um, item number four. Um, Commissioner Ball suggested that we um, talk about that as well, and which is um, 
good because I think it's what we heard a lot about through the testimony, through the hearings that we had, through written testimony that was submitted. Um, and just to um, refresh your memory from that testimony, there were really two issues that related to the Hayden Ireland pathway. Um, the Hayden Island Pathway is designated um, already in the TSP uh, along the northern shore, along the Columbia River of Hayden Island. Um, staff's intent was really to be consistent with the Hayden Island plan that was adopted by council in 2009. Um, the ordinance number's up there. And uh, we, um, with the first issue, we mistakenly um, included a segment of the, um, the pathway that went along uh, the Waterside, Waterside Marina and also um, Hayden Bay. And so we were proposing in the consent package to um, remove that from the proposed draft so that we are consistent with the action that council took um, uh, amending it um, in 2009. So that's one issue. The second issue was we heard testimony from a number of others on the other end of the island, on the, the west end of that path, um, asking that we remove the classification along um, the, the river um, from the bicycle classification. I think one thing I really want to make clear is that um, the, the, the first issue, the, the eastern lay segment that we're asking to remove to be consistent with city council, that's the bicycle classification. It was adopted with the pedestrian classification, so there is a trail classification for pedestrians there in the TSP. So um, staff's recommendation is to stay consistent with what's already in the TSP, what was adopted by council, and um, we're not recommending proposing any changes to the alignment along Hayden Island. Um, the question about the um, uh, implementation or the construction of a trail on the eastern, uh, on the western end, excuse me, um, where we have both the pedestrian and bicycle classifications. Um, the uh, important clarification on how that would occur. We do not have any um, recommended projects identified in, in, to improve that pathway in either the Portland Bicycle Plan for 2030 nor in the transportation system plan, which is our 20 year plan for investments. Um, so there is really no um, capital project that would initiate uh, construction of that trail. The trail would not likely occur unless the property was to redevelop. And so um, again, our proposal is to retain the, um, the, the, the bicycle classification on the, the West End, which was the result of the two year Hayden Island plan process. Andre? So, um, I had asked for um, number four to be removed um, because this was, um, oh, at the time in 2009, was actually a blank piece of property. Today it's built out. And um, the, um, we had a lot of discussion around Hayden Island, and I'll bleed over into the actual one that you're talking about. Um, it, it, there was a sense at that time that we wanted to put lines on the map to really provide an opportunity if transportation had an opportunity to get um, not only pedestrians but bikes accessible along the river because of our lack of, of that at that time when you looked at the city. Um, and the idea was to get some lines on a map and, and not with specific um, that it was going to go through someone's property, their trailer, um, and and when you look at the lines, some of them are actually in the water, and there was just a desire by I think um, Michelle was here, kind of us to say, we think it's a good idea to put there. At the same time, we were talking about increasing the capacity of Hayden Island with a lot of residents, so that seemed to be compatible with our increased density at the time. Um, we've taken that density off, and then maybe council's going to change that. But <laughs> in some of their amendments, I think, that are on the table, they may change that because of uh, what you see today. And in, 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 in here is a proposed bridge 
that um, secondary bridge that would come through. Uh, in 2009, there was the consideration of a CRC that's gone. Now there's the secondary bridge that's a consideration by council. Um, if you do have the residents there, the opportunity to have a line on the map around a bike path is something we ought to hold on to. Whether or not it's built and whether or not it's in the river or whatever is a future consideration. But if you take it off, we will never have that opportunity to ride a bike along the Columbia River ever again. And, and I, we have very few places along our rivers that we can truly ride a bike long distances along a river path for a city of our size. And, and I, I think it's, um, it's just a placeholder. It doesn't mean that we're going to take out trailer parks or anything else at this point. And I would just say my, my view is if we can leave them on there, we're fine with uh, just no changes. And to leave the, um, the other map that was actually on there and council change back to take it off. Um, and at the time, if I remember right, I think the developer said yes, but council said no. Um, and that was the confusion with transportation on the consent item four. So what's your desired disposition of those items? Um, my desire is on um, consent item four is to um, leave the line on the map. So I believe that's option B. Is that option B? That's option yeah. B, yeah. No oh, changes. No, um, no. Option B. Oh, because that's discussion. That's but discussion on. <laughs> on but it'd be like option B, would it, it not? It would be like option B. Option B um, on consent item four and then on um, actual um, discussion item six would be option B. So yeah, I think the just to clarify, um, we didn't present an option for the consent okay. items, yes. so it's right. it's not option B, um, but it would be retaining what's there. Yeah, retaining what's there. Um, retaining. And our, our proposal for that consent item was to remove it to be consistent with the Hayden yes. Island plan and the current TSP. So just so I'm clear, you want to keep a bike path through Hayden Bay in that area? Yes. So it would be... Um, that would be a change from what City Council right. adopted. It would be a okay. It would give City Council another option to... Say no. <laughs> Another opportunity. Can I clarify with a? Is there a map I can look at both these options? Yeah, let on? Me, I mean, there's. Yeah, I, we do have one. Sorry, discussion I'll amendments just, list number six. Attachment P is the other place you might look. Attachment, for attachment D in your your um, packet. Which one? D. D. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's any maps in here. I'm looking. Yeah, I'm going to need a map to figure this out. So there is a map in attachment P. Um, oh, it's attachment C. Oh, maybe not. Hold on. It's part of attachment oh, it's D and it's oh, exhibit it's C. C. So, yeah. And if, okay. if you're interested in what is in the current proposed draft, that's in section five on um, page seven. Page seven. So those are the Andres proposing this. Which is so the can you take a point? Yeah, point sure. I like some pointing. Yeah, I, I would like to clarify so which the, um, the, is at the top oh. is the. Oh. Oh, he's got. Yeah. It goes currently. It goes to um, just directly straight down. Straight down. Yeah. Yeah. So it just comes at the end of that. Yeah. Here, all the way around. Keep going. Keep going. All the way. And, and then straight, straight down. Straight down. Then connects. Yeah. So that's one. And then the other part that they 
which would be item six, is the dotted line. At the very top. At the very top, yeah. yeah. I want to keep that, yes. Yes. Yeah, that section of Hayden Bay was what was in the an earlier draft of the Hayden Island plan and then was removed yep. by council. So, just to clarify, the, um, Andre, the, the proposals that get us there are acceptance of consent number no. four and no, no. Um, rejection, rejection of, of four. Rejection of four and, and acceptance, acceptance of six. Six on the discussion. Discussion, right? yes. I guess so, option B, acceptance of option B on item discussion item six. That gets us the dotted line shown on the map right now. Yes. And then rejection of the consent item gets us the additional right. fundage. Yes. Thanks. So could I make a proposal that we take them as two separate motions? Good yeah, idea. I, I like yes. <laughs> Does somebody so, want to make that motion for me? I'll make the first one on um, discussion item six, Hayden Island. We uh, recommend and adopt um, I, um, staff recommendation B. Second. Second. <laughs> yes, question. Discussion? Yeah. So, where's the map that was um, causing the concern that the um, mobile home park was going to be lost? Because both of these look like it's in the draft. lines along the edge. Yeah, right. it's in the draft. So it's showing it all along there. Okay, I just don't see how that's cutting through a neighborhood. It's this. It's this. Um, yeah. Okay. It's 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 on the very well, edge the of the okay. of the river. But it's on the edge. It's on the edge. Okay. Yes. I guess I have a clarification then, because a lot of the testimony we heard related to the concern neighbors had that by drawing this line on the map, it will cause redevelopment and displacement. And my interpretation is that by drawing the line on the map, it means that a condition of redevelopment would be to put in the bikeway. And so I'm going to ask, I guess, would that same, if I'm interpreting that interpretation, would that same dynamic apply in the additional areas that um, would, we, if we extend that path along that think, Commissioner Ball raised? Just, or are there, are there similar uses there that they might complain? This is going to redevelop it, or someone else might say a condition of redevelopment of yeah. those areas, not yet drawn on this map, would trigger a right-of-way. Both sections go through private property, so okay. both of them would be similar in that uh, we don't have any capital projects identified for it. A lot of the concern was that we were going to come in and uh, improve the path um, through existing homes or uh, along the existing uh, right. marina. but. Yeah, I think what would actually think happen is the just one one other clarification is that um, the area that is not is being proposed to be added on or to be um, retained that's um, on the the eastern end, there is a pedestrian classification there. So there would still be a discussion and negotiation with a developer about putting a trail along the path. The question is about the bicycle classification specifically. And and keep in mind, um, just recently. Um, there are paths um, on Hayden Island right now that um, are on private property that uh, residents have said they wanted to close, and the city, including the mayor, have said, no, you won't. Um, so there is some precedent that um, at least council wants to keep pedestrians and bikes on, on those areas along the, um, the river. Hunter, just to clarify, I thought mm -hmm. you said the city council, and I'm not sure which decision, rejected continuing the dotted line? In the Hayden Island plan, yeah. um, we adopted the line, council, my understanding, well, removed the line, at, and there was a development that occurred in the bay, and, but it kept the pedestrian path for how, that. How recently was the Hayden Island plan adopted? 2009, and that amendment was on August 19th of 2009. Okay. So, so it was six and a half years ago that council said something. I, I would be uncomfortable putting something back in front of council if they had just decided otherwise more recently. But and, if it was yeah. a six and a half year ago decision, uh, I'm more comfortable with what you're proposing. Okay. 
Okay. Any other discussion items for that one? Do you want to? You got a second, so, correct? Well, we've got a second. So we need to vote on the. So let's vote on your motion first. Yeah. And if you could just restate it okay. just so we all know which um, one we're voting on. That we adopt and uh, approve the recommendation on discussion item six, okay. option B. Right? Yes. 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 She's left. Yes. It passes. Okay, so the next one. Um, my recommendation is for consent item number four that we um, reject staff's um, recommendation and I guess put the dotted lines back on. Essentially, our recommendation was to remove them from the proposed draft, so we wouldn't be making a change. Okay, so um, our, the recommendation is make no change on consent item four. Chris? So I'm in a, a little bit of an awkward position in that when this first came up at the hearing, in advance of the hearing, and staff proposed their errata memo, um, I said I would introduce the errata amendment and support it, so I feel honor bound to do that, which is probably a lesson to me to keep my big mouth shut. Um, so I'm not going to comment on the merits either way, just say that I committed to vote for this, so I'm going to honor that to the community. I don't necessarily think what Andre is saying is a bad idea, but uh, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. So it needs a second. Yep. Oh. Second. Okay. And Joe, you had your hand up. I just want to clarify um, the reference in the motion. Uh, I think what we're... Um, what the commissioner intends is no change in the propose in the recommendation that's in the proposed draft. That's correct. correct. In the right. but the yes. clar to clarify that does change what's in the TSP. Yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yes. Okay. Eli, did you have a? Yes, sir. Okay. Any other discussion points? No. With that, Julie. Yeah. Despite my. Bit of confusion, I'll go ahead and vote yes because I'm going to trust your judgment, Andre. That, that, that you. We're ending up where we should, so I vote yes. Yes. Marcel. Yes. Oxman. Yes. Yes. As I committed to do, no. Feedback. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Schultz. Yes. Okay, passes. Back up to where we were before, and I'm going to invite uh, Peter Hurley. And yeah, and let's see. TSB. Huh? Actually, before we talk about, uh, we'll leave it on Hayden Island Pathway for a moment. I'm going to. Before we talk about uh, transportation demand management, uh, there was a request from. Uh, one of the commissioners, I believe, uh, Commissioner Baugh, to uh, discuss the ordering of the uh, performance measure, the uh, mode chair targets and the performance <laughs> measures. So that was on the uh, originally on the consent list. Oh, and yes. Is uh, item seven. Yeah, thank you. So item seven on the consent list is mode chair targets, and when you go to objectives, eleven point. 13G, um, it has transit, bicycle, walk, and carpool. I'm actually fine with those, but the ordering of them, words matter. Um, and so I'd like to start with walk, bike, transit, carpool, just reorder them. And, and the, the reason is that's consistent with the rest of the TSB and, and, and our kind of hierarchy of how we look at um, prior, prioritization of what we want people to do. And Commissioner, you're talking about the uh, the bullets. The bullets, be, yes, the bullets. I'm, not, I, I'm okay. not changing the percentages or anything. I'm just reordering them. We're following the nine point, policy 9.6 ordering. Yes. Right. And I'm happy to support that. I'm just reordering them. Second. Discussion? Oh, you want a second? I'll second it. 
That's our second second, but thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't All good, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you ready to fill in? Yes. Okay. <laughs> if I can get it right, alphabetical order. Okay. Uh, back rack. Sure, yes. Bob. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to go by order. Smith. <laughs> yes. Larcel. Yes. Um, and Rudd. Yes. Oxman. Yes. Spivak. Yes. Okay. Schultz. Yes. Okay. Thank Passes. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Joe. Do you need to take a vote on the uh, yes. overall on the uh, the performance targets? It doesn't sound like. Sounds like the issue we had was just the order. So okay. I think we're good to go there. Go. And now Correct. we'll just yes. move on to discussion item seven. Okay. <clears throat> I'm back. Judith Gray with the Bureau of Transportation. Um, so we're going to talk about transportation demand management. And so for anyone needing a refresher on just the definition, when we talk about transportation demand management, or TDM, we're referring to a broad range of strategies that are intended to help people choose a transportation choice other than a single occupancy vehicle. It could be as simple as a walking and bicycling map. It could be a larger investment, such as free transit passes or a shuttle system. It would include parking management. Um, also, employers that offer telecommuting for their employees. So it's a really huge um, range. The role of a TDM plan for our private development partners and institutions is really essential for us achieving our, our um, growth goals. Um, it, and maintaining the operations, a reasonable operation of the transportation system. That said, we've heard a lot of, we've heard a lot of support in general for transportation demand management from stakeholders as well as members of this commission, but a lot of questions remain about the specific roles and requirements on developers, building tenants, service providers in the city. There are a couple of specific uh, issues that we're able to address with some code changes, and so Peter will go over those in just a minute, and those are included in your packet. There are some other more complex issues that are going to require additional process and stakeholder engagement. You've asked us to come and share with you more precisely how we're going to take that process and where the ensuring that there would be transparency and inclusion in the adoption of any new requirements, and so that's what I'm going to share with you. Um, in your packet, there is a proposed scope of work that I've developed. I thought this timeline was in there, but I didn't see it in the packet, so that's okay. I'll just talk a little bit about it. This timeline is intended to illustrate approximately a five-month engagement process to finalize some of the policy requirements, uh, administrative rules as necessary, and then take them to council in time for the adoption of the comprehensive plan and or the Central City 2035. So most of the work would be done in about a five-month time frame. Oh, excuse me, six month time frame. So it was specifically laid out this way to see if we could meet that target. But I want to say that the real goal will be to make sure that the outcome is the best quality. So there may be shifts with resources, scheduling of advisory committees, that sort of thing. But this would be the intended um, process. Key aspects, it's not an unusual uh, scope of work, but the yellow stars would be representing a stakeholder advisory committee to make policy and plan recommendations. But also critical to that would be those green dots represent a working group. And that, I think we would need some input from, in particular, developers and service providers, also perhaps a private TDM service providers like the Lloyd District, TMA, Go Lloyd that sort of thing. So that's really to get some expert guidance on how the, what the best way is to implement TDM requirements in new development. The draft scope of work in your packet in, is intended to be draft because I think that we would actually, in the process of working with this, the advisory committee, identify perhaps additional issues or clarify what the scope would be. But just for example, from the mixed use zone and central city stakeholders that we've talked to, we know that we need to get a better handle on all of the current transportation uh, contributions that they make in systems development charges, local improvement districts, as well as new requirements that are being proposed. Uh, we think that's certainly relevant as we consider additional costs that they may incur. 
For campuses and institutions, one of the things that we've heard especially is a need for a more clear and objective evaluation process for TDM plans to be approved, but also to better relate how their TDM plan requirements fit in the development review process. And I know that the development review staff would also like to see us be able to use TDM strategies as partial mitigations instead of always looking at capacity-based strategy mitigations with development applications. So there's internal uh, conversation to be had there as well. Um, affordable housing is an issue that we need to be very clear about given its priority with the city now and if these are requirements for new housing developments, we want to be very deliberate and not contrary to some of our other objectives. At the same time, I think that people who are in affordable housing's, housing are some of the primary beneficiaries of having a really um, balanced transportation system to serve them. That's why the draft scope of work that we shared has um, does say that we would finalize the scope of work with the advisory committee, probably after the first meeting. Sometimes that might take a second meeting. That's the concept of the timeline. Um, next slide, please. I think to get to some of the concerns I heard from you, from this group, is ensuring the process for the decision. And so what I've listed in the draft scope of work under task five is the policy adoption. So first of all, any new fees to developers we would take to council. I believe that's actually required anyway, but we would just make the commitment that any new fees would go to council for approval. Additionally, and some of this was written knowing how constrained the schedules are for both planning, for both you and council coming up through the next you know, eight, eight to 12 months. So we would certainly be prepared to go to council with a, a presentation of all of the TDM program but if we had a recommendation from the advisory committee or the transportation commissioner or and the transportation commissioner, we would want to have the opportunity to simply proceed into a, to rulemaking. Um, I hope that makes sense. My, my hope would be that if the process is really good, that the stakeholder advisory committee would not make us compromise the, the, the approvals in time for the comprehensive plan and the central city plan if they would be able to support approval by themselves. And also, if requested, we would come to you for a rec recommendation to council. Again, um, probably working to your staff, if there was a, a desire for that, we are prepared to do that. We think it would be really helpful. The only reason I made it an optional deliverable is that, again, thinking about the timeline, and I wouldn't want to put it in here as a commitment if you were comfortable and if it was going to compromise our ability to get it in with the rest of the comprehensive plan. So that's the process for developing the final uh, rules and requirements, and the approval. With that, let me ask Peter if it's OK, and we can talk about this, but maybe Peter can just go through some of the specific changes in the Title 17. I ask a question, which will help me respond to what you're going to present, Peter. So you're, you've laid out this thoughtful scope of work, and I like some of the things you said that would be considered. So that goes forward, and yet you're wanting us to recommend approval of, of Chapter 17-106. That's right. Because I'm, I'm a little confused. I see those in conflict. It can be a little confusing. It can, it can be very <laughs> I've been confused be several times confusing. today. So. Let's just, so we're dealing with three different places where the rules and requirements would reside. Um, Title 17 lays out the Bureau of Transportation's requirements. And developers would be pointed to Title 17 to see those requirements based on a development application. So Title 33 for Central, uh, excuse me, for Central City um, 2035 for campus and institutions and the mixed use zone, those different sections would say, this is the trigger, you have to do a TDM plan, go look at Title 17. So those triggering mechanisms. Many times when we get into the details, um, especially when you have a changing environment like car sharing and bike sharing and different tools are available. We want to do those in the administrative rule process because it's more flexible and we're able to respond to changes. Um, and so that's the other place. We think most of the outcomes would come in the administrative rules. And so it that is why approving this Title 17 language in and of itself does not re re create that requirement. Is that right? Yes. So uh, Title 33 is what triggers 
uh, the application of Title 17. Title 17 in and of itself, your action, if you choose to, to do so today, would simply clarify what would be required in a TDM plan and what we've heard from uh, developers, neighbors, building owners, and others is be clear, be more specific. And this is an attempt to provide greater specificity and greater clarity. It only applies if and when you and then city council acts on the Title 33 land use code that says go do a TDM plan. So this would not apply to mixed use zones or central city uh, or even uh, the campus institutions unless and until city council acted. Okay. That, was, that was very helpful to understand. So one quick yeah. question. Should, as we move through the process on um, mixed use zones, central city, this somehow Title 17 language comes back into play or discussion, is there an opportunity to certainly revisit what gets recommended today? Yeah, yes. in fact, the draft, the draft scope of work identifies that there is a potential for those Title 33 or Title 17 to change, especially when it relates to development code. Of course, obviously, we'd be working with Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for that. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Peter? Okay, go ahead, Eli, and then Michelle. Um, well, that's good to hear, because I, I guess if the threshold gets low, then ongoing performance might, requirements might be more problematic for small projects. But th there's one, one thing in here, in terms of modifying the performance targets, um, it talks about that the applicant can request a modified performance target, but it doesn't talk about who makes the decision on whether it's approved or denied. Um, is that something I missed in here, or is that something that could be clarified so it's not? Yeah. I'll actually make a reference to another uh, component in here. The staff, uh, the Portland Bureau of Transportation staff makes a recommendation, but the approval is either by, uh, for a by-rate project, it would be the uh, Bureau of Development Services, uh, or in certain cases, depending on the application, a hearings officer. So it would not be PBOT staff, which is why we're suggesting uh, removing some language in there that was more explicit about PBOT staff. That would be true with the, the modification as well, that it would be PBOT staff that would make a recommendation, okay. but BDS staff and or the, hearing, or the hearing examiner that would make the decision. Okay, that helps, thanks. I wanna say, in act, <clears throat> it's in part this item that gets back to what we heard from the campuses and institutions about wanting something more clear and objective and less subjective according to a particular reviewer it would also be helpful with the hearings officer process. So. And how does the public know when, you know, six years from now, the administrative rules are being revised? The, uh, we, we are, as part of this process, going to specify the review process. I, uh, I think it, it is our intent, and Judith, feel free to, to tell me if this is uh, not the case. It's our intent to provide notice if there are changes along those lines. The administrative rule, the intent is uh, to have as much clarity in the code as possible, which is why we're proposing these amendments. The administrative rules would be uh, minor modifications. Okay, and the notice would go to who? The, I, the uh, we need to, uh, as part of the administrative rule process, specify who would be notified as part of that. Presumably, it would be uh, the same notice that we would give as part of any other administrative rule that we that the Bureau of Transportation has previously adopted. Okay, and I don't know who that is. Yeah, so. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> So that was, that was one of the very issues that led us to develop this process. And as far as I know, we don't currently have a formal process for notification for change in administrative rules. If the advisory committee felt that that was necessary, it could come forward. Um, I hadn't thought of a specific obligation yet of notification of administrative rules just because I'm not certain if that would be a very much of a departure from current practice. So I just want to be clear about that. But again, I think it's a fair question and it's the kind of thing that we would be um, wanting to hear from the advisory committee about. And if they recommended it or if you want to recommend it to us now that we include that in the scope, you can certainly add that in. I think it's something we've heard before. 
I suggest, unless it's quick, Jeff, are you it's, jumping in? It's not quick. I was going to say that we let Peter well, maybe finish I, up. I was going to ask whether we want Peter to make his presentation. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Certainly. So, so there's, quick, uh, that was the answer. Okay. There are two components. Uh, one is the uh, Title 17106 language, which is in the, dra the uh, proposed draft of the Transportation System Plan. And that essentially lays out, here are the six components that should be in each uh, TDM plan. So we have a consistent, the idea being that there would be a consistent format that everybody would know. Uh, the applicant, the staff, the neighbors would all know what the components of the TDM plan are. We did hold uh, two meetings in November with uh, developers, building owners, building managers, uh, neighborhood organizations, environmental organizations, modal advocates. And we got some feedback through those two meetings and then subsequent meetings in January, February, and March with a similarly uh, diverse group of uh, folks that are interested in this. And the comments that we got back were along the lines of provide greater specificity in the code around specific components. So the first of those, uh, labeled A, and on in your document, there's a uh, circular A to the left of uh, the first proposed amendment, and that is around the performance targets. So what we're saying is the performance targets uh, would be those adopted by council in the transportation system plan. So I mean, we know where to, uh, to go to, to find those. Uh, the second item would be that the idea of interim performance targets because for some of these TDM plans, there's say a three-year plan or a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, rather than establishing a 2035, 20-year target, we would establish a three-year, a five-year, or a 10-year. And for predictability, the idea would be to use the a straight line method for the interim target, since that was one of the questions that came up. Any questions on that one? So B, uh, the, another thing that we heard was, what if the TDM plans that uh, we have in place now are working well? We as the Bureau of Transportation certainly want to encourage uh, successful plans to, uh, to continue to uh, move forward and uh, uh, continue to be successful. So one of the recommendations, one of the things we heard is that uh, if a site is already meeting those future uh, targets, the performance targets, uh, let's go ahead and keep that plan in place. Certainly, even if you're not precisely meeting the target, but there are components in that plan that are successful, uh, we are certainly going to support continuing those components as well, and it's something that we do currently with TDM plans. This just makes it even more explicit that that is our intent, particularly if you're uh, hitting those future year performance targets. So the next one, C, on approval, we're recommending removing the language under approval required. Uh, the language, uh, that, as I talked about a moment ago, the Bureau of Development Services or the hearings officer approves development applications. So this makes that the removal of the language that we had originally proposed is consistent with the approval process. Item D, modifying per, uh, performance targets. Uh, questions just came up on that. This clarifies that the applicant uh, can request a modified performance target and some of the, the uh, factors that we would consider as part of that modification process. Again, ultimately, it would be up to uh, Bureau of Development Services or the hearings officer to make that determination. But this provides some clarity on what factors we would consider as part of it, or at least some of the factors that we would consider. E, uh, it's a, a, a consistency, using the term uh, chapter rather than section, so we're using it uh, uh, in both places that it's referenced in the enforcement section. And finally, F, this is an item that came up uh, several times. Uh, are we going to enforce the performance targets themselves? So the idea is that a TDM plan would be written to achieve a performance target. That's the intent. Uh, we, are, we are suggesting language here that if the, uh, the, if the institution or the entity is implementing the components in that TDM plan, for example, providing 
uh, the walk and bike maps, doing the performance monitoring, sending the reports in, providing if there is a uh, some type of low cost transit pass, if they're providing that, that, that they are complying with the component, the TDM plan itself. If the price of gas uh, drops precipitously and the mode share, they don't hit the mode share target, uh, that really isn't their responsibility. And so what we would enforce is not the performance target itself, but the agreement to provide certain TDM strategies. So those are the uh, modifications that we're recommending at this point in time in response to the comments that we received from uh, the public at various sessions we had in November, January, February, and March. Okay, questions? Jeff? Yeah, I've got several concerns <laughs> on several different levels. And I've got some very specific concerns, but I think what I'd like to just take a minute or two is talk more from a policy perspective and what, what we're all trying to collectively achieve with these plans. So it talks about performance standards. As I understand, that's starting with, I've got objective 11.13 here, the mode splits. That, that's the performance standards that an individual applicant needs to come in and demonstrate how their project is going to meet those. Am I generally correct? Okay. So ultimately, no matter what you put in words, there's a lot of discretion, whether it's PBOT, or the planning department is reviewing someone's transportation demand management plan. I mean, it's just hard to say, here are objective standards. And even though the code says in some, several places, we'll look to these objective standards, it's really hard to make them objective. And I'm concerned from a policy standpoint, if it's a large campus industrial, they've got an ability to bring in experts, to negotiate, to work with staff, because they know this campus industrial plan is going to be sort of a public document. City Council is going to review it. So they've got some incentive to kind of give and take, and you hopefully end up, whether it's a Providence who's commented quite a bit or any other large campus, they've got more ability to navigate the uncertainties of this process. And hopefully the public's well served by that give and take, and a large campus industrial user ends up with a transportation demand management plan that, that works. But this is now for, going to start applying to mixed use. And the code that we're about to see shortly says any mixed-use project that's got 10 housing units or more needs a TDM. So now we're not dealing with a large camp. We're dealing with potentially a small developer trying to do a mixed-use project. They're always tricky, financially difficult. I've got 10 units. And now i got to know what, what do I need to do for a transportation to management plan. And I'm concerned with this problem of we have citywide generic goals, 25% transit, 25% bicycle use. So I'm doing 10 units, and I'm being asked to say how my 10 units is going to achieve these mode splits. That's a tricky proposition. I'm just trying to get this project through, and you're asking me to say how my 10 units are going to do that. I mean, and you could suggest give all your tenants bus passes. Is that good enough? Does that achieve it? So I, I'm, I'm concerned we're setting up this very uncertain uh, discretionary process, because I'll go through it with you. I don't see a lot of certainty. The certainty is here's the city's macro mode splits. This is the goal. We all want to achieve it. I'm doing 10 units, and I'm supposed to know what I should do with my 10 units to achieve these ambitious long-term goals. I think that's a that's a, that's a burdensome task to put on a, a project, whether it's 10 units or 20 units, particularly, and this is an aside, if you're doing mixed use, you're inherently serving the, the goals of you know, more multimodal use. I mean, it's almost an inherent byproduct of doing a mixed use project, and still I need to somehow justify how my 10 units can comply with these global goals. I, I, I think that sets up that developer for a very uncertain process. So Commissioner, we agree with you. And as a result, in the proposed draft that will be in front of you uh, for the mixed use hearings in uh, May, June, and then perhaps a decision in July, 
one of the things that we proposed and we worked with our uh, colleagues at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability is what we're calling a pre-approved plan. The idea being that because we don't want people to spend a lot of time and uh, money in for a 10 unit or a 20 unit development, uh, for a buy right development, uh, that we have looked at the various research that's been done over many years in many locations to determine what are successful strategies, many of which have been employed here in Portland. And so what we're suggesting is that, uh, recommending, is that a, an applicant have a choice. They have a pre-approved plan, which uh, we think will take advantage of the uh, pedestrian, bicycle, and transit infrastructure that is in many of the mixed-use areas and uh, significantly improve both the, the uh, mode share and reduce the uh, parking impact. And it's essentially a three-page document that you take off the shelf. And uh, we have tested that with a, uh, a few, we are in the process of testing that now and have uh, with a limited number of data points, found a pretty positive response. So you're saying far. we'll get that three pages, which I would hope for, if I'm doing 10 units, you could show me on one page, but three pages, <laughs> one pages. And that we're gonna get when we get the, this, the mixed use zone project. There's, a, there's actually a draft of it in the transportation system plan. Uh, the process that, uh, but it's not in 17106, which you want us correct. to correct, and that's on. that is because what we want to do is to go through a process of getting further uh, comment on that pre-approved plan, and this was a, a very deliberate process that we went through, where we don't want to get ahead of the mixed-use uh, process or the central city process. We do want to have a conversation with. Uh, and, and we we have we want to continue that conversation to get feedback on that pre-approved plan. So why I'm confused again. So I've started looking ahead to what's coming, and it doesn't jive well with 17106. Uh, you tell me you you've got objective standards that a smaller developer could pull off the shelf and use, but they're not referenced or incorporated into 17106. And then you're saying, but we're going to have a process. Uh, I guess it seems very premature to ask us to approve 17106 when such important components are missing, both your objective standards, and I'm reading where we're going to be code sections under mixed use. I'm going, wait a second. I, I see disconnects already between the code language for mixed use zone. I'm looking at, I can walk you through it. I don't think everyone wants to dive deep on it right now, but I'm, uh, and then I have some specific concerns with what's in here, but just conceptually, I'm just at a loss to understand with all these missing elements, why we're pulling one piece out of a package. So 17106 would not apply to the, the mixed use zones unless and until you hold those hearings and have that right. conversation. So, so, so now we're going to have a hearing, let me finish, and we're going to be dealing with this issue. We're going to have mixed use zoning questions. How and when does TDM apply? Should it apply to 20 units or 10 units? And it will then point us, the code points us to 17106. So we're going to have a locked in document when we're trying to figure out how to integrate 17106 with some brand new code language. Why do we need a locked in 1706? So I, I just Commissioner, the, uh, the, the chair asked earlier if there would be, if you choose at some point in time in the future to make amendments to uh, 17106 or if we uh, choose to come back with recommendations, you certainly have that opportunity to do so. But I would, uh, would point out that the language in the mixed use section does refer, essentially uh, the way it's written, it refers to the off the shelf plan or if somebody wants to, they can do a custom plan. Which would but be the, uh, when it the language here? To the off-the-shelf plan, it says here's an option: go to the objective standards in 17106. We don't know what those standards are because you're telling me these aren't the objective standards; they're to come. So I, again, I just see a lot of gaps that I'm <clears> just <throat> at a loss to know. I, and I, this goes to another policy concern I have. 
it's really hard for a developer. I'm already seeing three different code section sites. I'm familiar with this process. In chapter 33, you go here, you go here, you go here, and then you go over to 17. And it's not clear to me yet who's implementing 17. So I'm a developer, and I've gone through all the, the TDM provisions in 33, and they point me to different places. And I may or may not go to 17. I'm not sure. It's unclear. So now I go to 17. Am I still talking to Planning Bureau or to BDS? Or does BDS go, oh, you want to take the offer after 17? Go set up a new round of meetings with PBOT. And I, I would like to see it all land in one place. And that may be an unrealistic expectation that two bureaus can, can pull it all together in one location. But that would be another request that, that it ends up in one place and saves Again, I'm not worried about a campus industrial user having the ability to navigate all this. But for time and money, someone wants, we, we want mixed use projects. In fact, we want small mixed use projects. I think that's a, a great product for the city. So anyway, I'm bothered. I do have very specific concerns, but I'll stop now because Eli's just dying to add in here. I want to toss in one example of small developer critique mm -hmm. is, is that um, Essential elements to any plan, which presumably applies to the off-the-shelf can plan in a can, you know, um, is a performance monitoring plan and ongoing participation in an adaptive management plan. Can you pull that off in a 10 to 20 unit project? Say you're selling condos. I can't see how you possibly could. Um, so I guess I wouldn't want to set up the stage where an essential element, like required element of a plan, um, can't be achieved with a I, I guess I, I look ahead as Commissioner Bacharach is, how, how do you actually implement that? How can you even talk about small projects when you're talking about someone's got to have a contract to ensure compliance or adapt, whatever it is, it goes out into the future in a way that um, is much more in the realm of large institutional developers than small development. Anybody else like to jump in here? Uh, Gary, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of questions. Um, what is the institutional scope for TDM? Is it going to be, you know, institutional campuses? It was clearly mentioned when we were discussing the, um, that aspect of the plan. But is there is there an intended scope in terms of institutional size or that this is going to apply to? So we took action back on January 26th on the uh, campus institutional zones uh, piece. There was a uh, component in there. You made a recommendation that in the future that they those 15 campuses and institutions that are part of those zones would continue to uh, have TDM plans, which is currently a requirement for the conditional use uh, and the impact mitigation areas. So at this point in time, uh, it would be those 15 campuses and institutions within the uh, CI zones. Okay, so these are large institutions, just the large institutions that are under the campus. Correct. Campus zoning, okay. Um, is there an intent to expand it to other, other existing entity or other new or existing entities? For example, you know, I put up a factory that employs a thousand, you know, a new factory that employs a thousand people not in an institutional environment. So the, uh, in the, uh, the mixed use zones uh, proposed draft, there was a proposal to have TDM plans, the uh, pre-approved TDM plans for mixed use development and mixed use development that uh, meet certain triggers. And then similarly in Central City 2035, there in the, uh, the draft there, there is a proposal for TDM plans, again, pre-approved TDM plans, uh, to be up, uh, you'd have a, a uh, pre-approved unless you wanted to do a custom TDM plan for many of the zones there. Okay, and on um, element C here, removal of the TDM plan improved in writing required prior to development, was that just removed because it, is that just a question of timing in the process? It's actually for consistency with uh, ensuring that the, that, or being consistent that it is the hearing examiner or the Bureau of Development Services 
that uh, makes the recommendation for development application approval. Okay. And then um, last question here um, on performance targets and on the interim performance targets and allowing those uh, to be determined by straight line projection. Um, a change like this is likely to be anything but straight line. And so I'm wondering if, if that's just not a little bit too restrictive. I, I mean, I, I really like the idea of going in with the idea of an interim standard and some adaptation along the way, but straight lining just seems like it may not be the right standard. Usually what's happened in the, uh, where this has been applied elsewhere, you get the greatest gains right at the beginning. So the, uh, you have a, a higher result in the first several years because there's a, uh, there are fewer people who are actually using options. Yeah, and there's an early adaptation, some yes. stalling, and then later acceleration, but none of that's linear. <laughs> Correct, yeah. This is uh, primarily for clarity and simplicity. Okay, I'm gonna go Joe and then Chris. Um, I don't wanna uh, cut off discussion of this, but we have another item today too. Um, but it sounds like we should bring this one particular item in um, the TSP or in what we're discussing today back with a little, uh, with an attempt to clarify some of the questions um, that you're, you're posing. Um, TDM is sort of integral to how we've built the comprehensive plan uh, around traffic capacity and, and vehicle capacity. So uh, we would need to, um, if it's not TDM, adjust something else to get that sort of forecast performance to work, so, such as uh, changing parking ratios or something like this. So we'd like to take another shot at sort of trying to clarify and answer some of these questions, if that's where the commission is. I know. So, so I just want to kind of try to make it succinct because I got to wrap up too. I just want to note for the record that uh, I suggested, Peter, that we consider TDM and employment zones, and he hung up the phone on me. So he's not trying to empire build. <laughs> <laughs> Andre? Um, and this is just the, in the enforcement. Um, the idea in F that um, full implementation of all elements of this chapter failing to meet the performance targets shall alone not be an enforcement. So is the, the idea that the fact that they're not meeting one, but they're doing okay on all the others, they're still overall meeting it is the idea here? Or is it you have to meet them all, all the performance targets or all the elements of the performance target? It really has to do with the, uh, the, the fact that if a, uh, an organization, when an organization uh, uh, submits a TDM plan, they say they're going to do certain things, yeah. like we're going to provide information to the residents or the employees on what their options are. We want, we want that because that's a commitment to be enforceable. Because there are other variables that, uh, as Commissioner Oxman was referring to, that, that cause the actual performance to vary over time, we thought it was fairer to focus on, are you doing what you said you're going to do, rather than are you getting the exact result? I, I guess I would want some clarification that um, not all the items they're asked to do are equal in terms of impact to the goal. And Correct. that there is, um, um, you know, you just couldn't send out notifications that to employees and say, well, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, that you're actually reducing parking and doing some of the other things, so. Uh, hopefully a quick question for you, Peter. In this, I know this is really clear in your mind and, and, it, and to you, well as Judith, and how this is all coming together. But um, if it's foggy for one of us, I can only imagine how <laughs> foggy it is for anybody else out there in the public. So my question kind of going back to you is, is there a way to move this forward without the TDM piece that allows you time to do the work that you need to do to do the public outreach that you need to do and bring it, like you suggested, back to us so that we can then make a recommendation that kind of looks at how this all comes together into a TDM plan instead of kind of having it as, a, as a, a piece of this now. And maybe you need to think about that and get back to us. I mean, that's fine too. Um, but I can, like I said, if, if we're having kind of this struggle, it's, it's got to be much, much more difficult for those in the public to follow what's going on right now. Yeah, I think clarity clearly is, is important. And uh, 
clarity and consistency, and perhaps we can. That has been the intent. <clears throat> It is, it's, it's a confusing process anyway, and then to have these sort of on different timelines with the triggering policies coming in the future, I can appreciate the confusion. Um, it's taken me quite a while to get caught up to the extent that I am. We have been out meeting with a few folks, most recently with the Portland uh, Business Alliance. As you can imagine, there was, uh, was quite a lot of interest there in how this would apply in the Central City 2035 um, plan. So our hope is that by the time that we could address the questions and get them approved and into the into policy at the same time as the comprehensive plan is being implemented. And so we're in a little bit of a catch-up mode to do it, um, but that's certainly our target. So I guess I'm still not sure I'm hearing whether this is an item we can kind of pull out of what we're looking at in this work session and kind of readdress at a different date um, after you've done some homework and side work or not no, you really don't feel that that's possible. You know, I'm really not certain. I think that's a question for Joe, really, okay. about the, the process. And, and what I'd like to recommend is that um, no vote today, and we'll come back with a number of things. To the extent that we can clarify sort of some of the questions that you've been answering or point clearly to that are not going to be clarified in this time frame, that could help. Uh, also, I want to be sure that we've considered thoroughly so that we can advise you on it. If we don't do this, what else do we have to do in the comp plan? So there's implications there that I just want to make sure we're all aware well, of, and, and that's I, good. I, perhaps I have a, one of my questions, and I might not be hearing this right, is I don't know if I'm hearing a question of no TDM plan from everybody, as much no. as how this is all coming together and what this process is. Mm -hmm. And that's where the concern is. And am I? Yeah, know, and I guess question, Joe. I didn't realize until a few moments ago that having some TDM provisions is essential for your capacity analysis and for completing the comp plan package. Am I understanding that right? There's implications for that, but I want to really quantify okay. that and, and well, see I, well, I guess what I'm wondering, is there a we, way to we have... We can pivot if that's okay. the okay. desire. Well, maybe there's a few options. I mean, yeah. maybe... Maybe there's a way to address your needs, have a TDM plan that's a bit more general, less specific, satisfies that capacity comp plan need, and then gives everyone more time to, and I, I, I had every intention of getting you some of my thoughts ahead of time, and I apologize for failing to do that. I think we're talking about more than clarity. I think I'm asking mm -hmm. sort of some policy questions. How can a TDM achieve its goal particularly when you start talking about mixed-use projects. And I'm, I think literally your thinking was more campus industrial, which is a different animal to me than one-off, one-time mixed-use projects. And I just thought maybe some more policy thought needs to go there, which I thought your, your task force was the, was the right vehicle to mm -hmm. think about that. And I thought that's what you were suggesting. So I don't know if I clarified anything or... Well, and then there could be an approach where there's a policy sort of inclusion in the TSP about TDM. Like it as a concept, as a practice, it's a solid, good, best practice. Um, but it's going to get um, as difficult. The kind of issues you're struggling with today, you're really going to see when we bring the task five work together because it's going to be code. So the kind of clear and objective questions you're asking, um, Commissioner, are, are clearly going to be in there. I have to make sure that you know, those code packages are also ready to move forward uh, and not going to provoke the same level of uh, concern. Talk I think what I'm also hearing from you is generally that uh, this is appropriate for campus institutions. You have questions about particularly some of the smaller mixed-use developments and when and how these would apply in a way that would tr be effective and uh, effective for both the developers, the building managers, and the neighbors. <clears throat> I see some nodding heads. Yeah, okay. I, th there are a that's, couple that's helpful for uh, us. of comments that were raised from Providence's letter mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I was sympathetic to about recording in CCNRs, mm -hmm. putting it in title. I'm not sure if that <coughs> so, is a good idea. Mm -hmm. But again, oh yeah, but generally, I, I think you're right. I'm more focused on non campus industrial. Though there's a few things in here about campus industrial at some point. I'd okay. So since we're there. running out of time, can I get some help with process? Like, do we continue the work session to another date to take care of this item? Is that what you're suggesting, Joe? Correct. Or do we have a date that 
we can target we, quite yet? Uh, we don't have a date, of, uh, but it's a work session, so okay. we, it's not a hearing, so we have more flexibility in that. We have to yeah, look at the calendar and see what we can move around. But then I gotta open up to Andre. <laughs> so, go ahead. So can <laughs> Catherine, I, I, oh, okay. I just wanted to ask if we, you know, if we wanted to further this discussion because there were some interesting things that came up, who would we send that those questions to? <laughs> Julie. Julie? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Andre? Uh, I guess my question would be if we have other amendments that didn't get captured here, I assume we can send those to Julie as well. Sure. Okay. Um, it, just a recommendation here. It can, I, I would like to make an amendment that, um, or, or a recommendation that we remove item seven from the current document today. <coughs> for consideration, but ensure that it comes back before the comp plan in time for approval through council of the comp plan, because we need a TSP mm -hmm. that includes TDM in the comp plan to close the deal. And so just that we move it today, I'm not sure timing with when staff needs to come back and what they need to come back with, but that it comes back in time that we get to review it, comment, and it gets to council in time to be included in the TSP and comp plan discussion finalization at council. And that's not for at least two or three months. So we do have some time at least. So I guess we don't have any council dates set yet, so. We don't, but we, there's a, so um, these were the two motions that were set up for tonight, uh, this so afternoon. And um, I just want to be clear, um, um, if we were to, I'm, I'm looking for a way to have the commission uh, sort of approve all the parts that you've amended, and so that as a package is done, and this pack, this part of it is, is not approved, and we have to bring it back before the whole thing uh, can be. Step forward. So Sorry. can I just um, recommend that we remove item seven from the TSP? Huh? Yeah, we want to remove it, right? And bring well, it back at a later date. We're day. not voting mm -hmm. on it, so we, what we would do today, I'm thinking, if I'm hearing this correctly, mm -hmm. first of all, we need to still vote on the consent agenda. Yeah. Yeah. There, and then what we would move too. forward is that everything that we have yet voted on and approved moves forward. Since we haven't voted on this item, we'll take it up in the next work session. Correct. Okay. 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 Yes, Chris. So I believe we still have two items pending, the consent agenda and no change item four. And if, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'll make up one motion to deal with both of them. Sounds great. Okay, I move that we uh, adopt the remainder of the consent list and that with regard to no change item four, we direct staff, and I believe this is pre-approved language for staff, direct staff to develop trips avoided performance measures and targets, including work at home share in stage three. <coughs> Second. Discussion? Okay, Julie. Backrack. Aye. Pa. Yes. Marcel. Yes. Oxman. Yes. Rudd. Yes. Smith. Yes. Spivak. Yes. Schultz. Yes. Okay. And then could we get a motion to basically, do we need to bundle what we've voted on to date or just? It's so is, is it that top motion? So we have the action of. Yeah on the screen at the moment, and that is um, what we propose is the, the proposed draft. So the, the request to PSC is to recommend to the City Council to amend the City of Portland Transportation System Plan as shown in the proposed draft of the TSP update stage two, um, sections one through 13 as amended tonight. The second one relates to Title 17, and that's because Title 17 is not technically part of the TSP, but we have uh, section 14, 15, and 16, which are Title 17 items. So it's amend Title 17 public improvements as shown in the proposed draft, section 14 and 16, sorry, section 14 and 16 as amended tonight. So Denver, which of those though is uh, referring? Section 14 is TDM. So that would section be the part that we would set aside. So section 14 would be set aside. Set aside. So it would be section 16 would be remain. remain. So I'll move what's on the screen with the exception of section 14. Any 
I second? I'll second. Okay, discussion? Just clarification, section 14 is the TDM, correct? That's correct. Thank you. And section 16 is street vacations. Which <laughs> <laughs> Just because don't so make I us don't. talk about that. <laughs> so I would, okay, so I don't know if this is a friendly amendment thing, but I would move out the street vacation because I would still like to have a discussion about the street vacation standards. So then we'd only be doing the top bullet? You so could just do the bullet. top bullet then. Fine, yep. then I'll, I'll withdraw my motion and remove that we just approve the top bullet. I guess quickly, Katie, you withdraw your second? Yeah, there's one. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. To, any discussion? Okay. Julie. Backtrack. Yes. Yes. Right track. Yes. 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 Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. That was very well organized. And ladies. Sorry, yes. <laughs> Judith. And I'd like to add my thanks. I uh, had a meeting and a lot of email contact with staff over the last week around this, and they've been very helpful, and I appreciate their support. Thank you all. Uh, so I'm going to make two suggestions. Um, First of all, the next item on the agenda is a hearing, and it's for residential and open space. So if anybody would like to testify, please fill out a form and bring it up to Julie. We are going to limit testimony to two minutes. Um, I'd like to be, we're going to take a break, but before we take the break, I'd like to go around and really have Jeff tell us, because <laughs> we already did this, um, if there's any conflicts of interest for the next hearing. OK, thank you. Uh, it, this may fall into the, the conflict, because I'm but. Uh, I own property, fourplex on Southeast 17th, that is on a list at City Council for possible amendment to the Planning Commission's recommendation. So I would be affected. So I, I guess, and I'm not sure if the property I own, I did not see it as part of the zone change being proposed tonight, this afternoon. So whether or not it is, I'm not sure if we're taking this. So I will not vote on anything to do with this area on Southeast 17th where I own property because it's sort of an, an active issue at city council. So I'll just have to parse through what we're doing and see. And I meant to ask ahead of time if we're taking an umbrella action on all the map changes or whether you're going to do it section by section. Or um, you would be making, you will be discussing all of the proposals at your next work session. So today it's just a hearing. So, right. okay. but when you're so at the point this? of so deliberating, I, I can, you'll be I can looking at it. certainly hear all testimony today. And between now and the time we take right. the vote, I'll clarify to be sure I'm not doing anything that could be perceived as voting on property that I have an interest in. Great. And it's good to have made that clear tonight as well. So thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. So five minute break, um, and then we'll be rolling after that. Sorry. Gotta use the restroom. <laughs>
Any commissioners who have a conflict of interest? Because I think there might be one potentially. Yes, I have to note, um, I have one property at 47, um, 47 thing going that is a subject to a potential zone change from R5 to R3. And if it's in this list, which I think probably is, then I'll back out of that conversation when it comes to the vote. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Deborah. Well, good afternoon. I'm Deborah Stein, Principal Planner with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And I want to just take a minute to thank everybody in the audience who's been patient um, waiting to be here to testify today. Um, I'm here to introduce the Residential and Open Space Zoning Map Update Public Hearing. And um, I think I'll, you've seen this before. This project is one of several what we've been calling Task 5 Early Implementation Projects. And these are zoning code and or zoning map proposals that are designed to help carry out the um, policies of the 20. 35 comprehensive plan. And um, I know you can't actually read this, but each of those task five projects is on its own track with its own process. You've already heard the employment zoning project that's come before you with the public hearing, the campus institution. This is the third one, which is um, residential and open space. You'll soon be hearing mixed use, which is the next up. And then there are a couple of additional code changes that will come before you after that. Um, one of the things I want to note, and you'll be hearing me mention this a couple times this afternoon, is that you're looking at the zoning map right now in layers, in separate layers, so you can kind of um, absorb the information about residential, about mixed use, about employment individually. But then in this sequence, we're going to then bring all those zoning map layers together into what we're calling the composite zoning map. And that offers both the public a chance to look at a more holistic map, but also you a chance to look one last time and make a recommendation to council about a unified zoning map that pulls all these layers together into one. And the timing of that is also important because that allows us to, one, incorporate any feedback we get from you in your, or direction we get from you in your deliberations about each of these layers. So for example, you're going to be holding a, a work session to uh, deliberate on the testimony you've heard up till this point in two weeks. And that will be preliminary direction for us for the composite zoning map. We also will have the opportunity at that point when we pull together this composite map to reconcile any zoning changes with decisions that city council is making right now about amendments to the comp plan. Because if they make some changes to comp plan designations that have an impact on zoning, we'll have to do that reconciliation. And you'll be seeing that in the composite zoning map. So right now we've got that tentatively scheduled for July 12th as another public hearing. Everybody will have one more chance to look at the zoning map in its entirety. So in putting together the uh, residential and open space zoning map proposal, staff did a pretty focused update of the zoning map. We did not undertake a comprehensive overhaul of the zoning map with every property in the city of Portland considered. Um, we focused on four categories, which you see here. Um, the first one, um, the third one, and the fourth one all are the ones we'll, I'll be talking about today a little bit more. And, and those are the categories we expect you to hear most testimony. Number two is basically a, a cleanup. It's pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to be touching on that. That's things like correcting um, split zones or, or odd things that so we just are align realigning some some designation. So I'm going to skip over that today. Um, I want to remind you that Portland has a two map system. So we have a comprehensive plan map, and that's what you've already made your recommendations to council about. And then we have zoning. The comprehensive plan map is a sketch of our sort of our vision of what the land use will look like in 2035. And the zoning tells us what can be done on any given property today. Now, in almost every case, those two things match. But there are some places where they deliberately don't match. And I'm going to be touching on that a little bit as I um, walk you through these changes. Uh, in particular, category number three is where we're deliberately creating a mismatch. And I'll explain that when we get there. So category one is zoning map changes that correspond with the 2035 comprehensive plan map. Um, you made recommendations to City Council, as you know, about the uh, 2035 comp plan map last year. And that's in front of Council, as you know, making their in the um, 
final stages of their decision making where they're considering amendments. Um, you might remember that the comp plan map proposed a lot of land use changes either to residential zones and to open space zones. In some cases, the residential changes increased potential density. In other cases, it reduced residential density. And an example of um, some of the down designations um, were in areas with natural hazard risks and stormwater and drainage constraints. That was one category. Um, and there were a number of others as well. Um, your recommendations in the comp plan map also applied open space designations to a number of properties that are owned by public agencies. Those are for properties that are currently in open space use or are proposed for open space use. And in those cases, we work closely with those public agencies to apply the open space where they requested it. Um, now, you may hear testimony today that is in response to the decisions you've already made and the council is now deciding about the comprehensive plan map. So we'll, we'll um, be flagging issues that may be related to a comp plan issue more than a zoning issue. Um, that may come up today. Um, I do also want to note that because council is now considering amendments to the comp plan map, there may be some changes to zoning that will be um, tied to those. And we will come back, as I mentioned earlier, in the reconciliation stage when we have a composite zoning map. But for now, our proposal is, um, is, is what we would propose today in advance of hearing what council decides about some properties. I hope that makes sense. OK, so the next category I want to touch on our zoning map changes in David Douglas School District. Um, we propose some limited down zonings within the David Douglas School District. And these are in the Mill Park and the Hazelwood neighborhoods. And these are proposed to temporarily ease the school district's current overcrowding situation. Now, in these situations here, in these places, we're proposing to retain the comprehensive plan designation and only make a change for now to the zoning. Um, this is in order to signal that once the current overcrowding situation is remedied, when the district is able to uh, acquire sites, build new schools, and they can address their, their capacity issues, then we'd be able to um, support upzonings either through individual zoning map requests from property owners, or we could also make changes legislatively all at one time. So this really is a temporary remedy. Um, I did preview this for you when we were talking a year or so ago about the uh, comprehensive plan. And I just want to make sure that it's clear these are um, pretty limited. And you can see on the map, they're, they're, they're fairly selected properties where we were proposing to change the zoning. Now, the reason why these are a little different than the areas where we proposed to down designate is these locations are relatively well served by everything except for school capacity. In the other places where we proposed down designations in the Powhurst Gilbert neighborhood, this was because of a lot of testimony and a lot of our understanding of the area where there were problems with connectivity, a lack of connectivity, a lack of services, a lack of amenity. So it was that combination of deficiencies that suggested that it really was an area uh, most suitable to be down designated. In these situations, those are not the case, but the school capacity continues to be a challenge. Now, these proposed zone changes are paired with a proposed code change, zoning code change, that you will be seeing as part of the miscellaneous uh, zoning code amendments. It's another one of those Task 5 projects. And that zone code, uh, that code change is going to add um, adequate school capacity <clears throat> Excuse me, hold on. Sorry. Um, adequate school capacity, that phrase will be added as an approval criterion for base zone changes and land divisions. And what that means is that for any uh, land division or um, requested zone map amendment, they would need to be able to prove that that development would not add to the um, the strain on school capacity. The school district, through inclusion of new objective criteria in a, in a long range facility plan, they'll propose some criteria that we would be then using to ascertain whether the new development request would further strain capacity. And if yes, that development would not be able to be approved. Um, that does not apply to any development that be allowed by right. And that's, that means anything that could be developed without having to go through that land use review. 
So that pairing of the map change and the code change are part of this consolidated proposal. Um, we're working closely with David Douglas School District on this. Um, they're in the process of finalizing their facilities plan now, and they're also actively looking for sites and looking for ways to overcome the, the deficiency. So we're, we're going to continue to work on that. And this proposal has the support of um, East Portland Action Plan, of school district, of a lot of the neighborhood associations, because there's a shared agreement that this, this um, capacity is really quite strained. The next category I want to talk about are zoning map changes that are designed to match the 1980 comprehensive plan. Um, about three and a half percent of properties across the city have zoning that don't match the comp plan designations, the residential designations that were applied back in 1980. And this is a snapshot from the official zoning maps where you see areas with that dotted line and then you see in Right in the center of the photo, it says R5, and then in parentheses, R2.5. So where you see that on a zoning map, it means that the zoning today is R5, but the comprehensive plan designation that was applied back in 1980 is R2.5. So through this zoning map update, we took a look at these areas throughout the city. and We called them zoning review areas. And um, after we published the discussion draft back in November of two. 2015, we evaluated 42 of these areas throughout the city. And we looked at them to determine, are they suitable? Are they ready for a zone change? Um, taking into account any changes to conditions, to development activity, to a number of things, infrastructure status, and so forth, are these areas suitable and ready to be upzoned up today to match what was applied back in 1980? And we found that where the criteria were met, um, these are areas, these are good areas that are suitable for providing a, a little bit richer of a mix of housing types. And these are all areas near opportunity areas. So we, we looked at those with um, uh, factors such as uh, transit and amenities and so forth. In the evaluation of these areas, um, we, we did consider a number of physical but also demographic social factors to, to, to do that kind of readiness test. And we did consult with neighborhoods as well. And through conversations with neighborhoods, we were able to even add some evaluation criteria that had been suggested by, um, by neighborhoods. So in the review of 42 of these areas, um, we proposed 24 for a zone change that are part of our proposal. And in the, um, in the um, proposed document, each of those 24 areas is highlighted in a page or two summary of the evaluation criteria and how we looked at the areas to, to, um, to make the proposal to go ahead and change. Um, generally, the residential areas, uh, residential zones are proposed to change in areas that have a combination of strong infrastructure investments um, proximity to transit, as I said, proximity to services and amenities, and have a lack of development constraints. And again, you can see on the individual reviews what, what our, our evaluation and our conclusion was. Now, the preponderance of these zoning review areas in which we're proposing to make a zone change are going from R5 to R2.5, so relatively modest uh, adjustment. Um, I wanted to just touch on what does that mean? What in these areas where there is a proposed change, what could a property, property owner do? So a change from R5 to R2.5 would allow a property owner to, number one, do nothing. They're certainly um, able to just retain a single family dwelling as long as they want. A second option is to convert an existing structure into a duplex that would be allowed in the R2.5. Um, not currently allowed in R5. The third would be somebody could demolish a single family home and replace it with one single family home. And they also would be able to demolish a single family home and replace it with a duplex. Now, for some lots that are in areas of these zoning review areas, if the lot is an interior lot and it's under 4,749 4, square feet, then a change from R5 to R2.5 actually has no effect. They would be too small to, to divide. So these images are just a, a, a handful of images to show some different um, 
types of recent development that has occurred in our 2.5. And you can see there's kind of a range there. And what we're finding as we look at new development in our 2.5 that a number of the, a, a, a large number of the new construction has been um, in the form of single family homes, not duplexes, which is interesting. Um, you'll be hearing testimony today. Um, I think what we as staff have heard is there is a mix of supportive testimony and opposition. Um, there is some concern that a map change might prompt demolitions. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, some testimony may be about people who are, um, maybe from people who are expressing concerns about the comprehensive plan map change that has already been proposed and is at council now. And real quickly, next steps. Um, you'll be hearing testimony today. You are scheduled to then come back in two weeks to discuss testimony you've heard to date and offer staff some initial direction, initial recommendation. We have um, recommended that the record stays open through the close of the composite zoning map, which is now scheduled for July. But we've, we as staff have been encouraging people to get their testimony in by today so that that could be worked into your recommendation as you deliberate um, in two weeks. Um, in June, we'll be publishing that composite zoning map I mentioned, and then again in July, you'll be making a, a recommendation about the full zoning map as, in its entirety. And I'll close just with uh, a map so that uh, I can leave this up. These are the proposed residential and open space zoning proposals. And as people testify, they may want to either point to something on that map, or we have a map here as well. Thank you, Deborah. Are there any questions? Andre? Um, relative to the demo, we have uh, the demo process coming back through us later this summer, correct? Demo process? The demolition. Demol demolition of homes, we have that coming back through us process later this summer. Is that part of infill? There's a residential infill project. Is that okay? What but we, you're we don't have now? the demolition process at all coming back through us? I'm not aware of a, okay. of a demolition process. Mm -mm. Talk about the one that already went to council? Oh. Maybe de deconstruction. Yeah, that, that is something that is coming to. OK. Yeah. Sorry for the confusion. Any other questions? OK. I'm going to call you up three at a time. Just as a reminder, again, if you're here to testify, please fill out a form in the back of the room and then hand it to Julie. Let's begin with Rebecca Mode, Arlene Williams, and Laura Miller. We will be limiting testimony to two minutes. Go ahead. That's okay. Just either, and either of you can start. That'd be great. Push. Is that it? Good afternoon. My name is Arlene Williams. I live at 5401 Southeast Henry Street. R2.5 is proposed for the R5 lots on my dead end street. That would create a public safety issue, an equity issue, parking and traffic congestion issues, and add more housing than this dead end street can hold. It would ignore the planning code and the fire code. All the details are in my written testimony. But if you could see my dead end street, you would know right away it won't work. It ends abruptly in a block wall and chain link fence. There is only one way out, and there is no turnaround. Fire code says you need a turnaround on a dead end street over 300 feet. Our street is 500 feet. You can't add a turnaround because there's houses in the way. It would be irresponsible for the city to allow more houses on a street that does not meet fire code, especially with four and a half acres on the next street over containing hundreds of tall Douglas fir in a church compound. That's a wildfire hazard. My neighbors know it is a bad idea. The last page of my written testimony shows support from the Woodstock Neighborhood Association 
And the next to the last page shows majority support from my neighbors on the street. They have done emails and they've also signed a petition. <clears throat> Code says that dead in, a dead end street should ideally only serve 18 dwelling units. Right now we have 17 apartment duplex units and 13 homes. That's 30. Up zoning to R25 could add 13 more for a total of 43. That's way too much for a dead end street. Please don't up zone this dead end block. It's not wise, it's not safe, and it's not fair. Thank you, Arlene. Are you supposed to start? Yep. Uh, my name is uh, Laura Miller, and I live at 4042 Southeast Franklin, and I'm opposed to the zoning being changed on my street from R5 to R2.5. I've talked to my neighbors in nearby homes, and they also oppose it. Um, one of those pictures that was showed earlier shows what it looks like at a, a few blocks from my house where a perfectly good middle-class home was knocked down and two monstrous homes were built on that lot. Um, and that's what we don't want to see to happen on our lot. I want to personalize this by saying I heard you mention about East Moreland and the plan to uh, change the lots there from a minimum 5,000 to um, 7,000. I happen to be a family physician. I bought my house in Richmond 21 years ago. I could have bought a house in East Moreland. If I had, I would still be working and working to pay for that house. Instead, I bought a more modest house in Richmond. I retired. I do volunteer work in our community. Now, I see patients for free. I wouldn't be doing that if I had lived in East Moreland, where I would be protected now from the changes that are being proposed for my street. That's what I would like to say. Thank you, Laura. Any questions? No, thank you. Oh, Eli? What do you think of the proposed down zoning for East Moreland? Well, it's nice for them. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to try one more time with Rebecca Mode or Modi, if I'm saying it wrong, Lori Kovac, Susan Whitney. Since I don't, since we're a short one, we'll go ahead and have Dominique Anya come up as well. Go ahead. Thanks. My name is Lori. My name is Lori. Could you turn your? I don't think it is. Thank you. My Lori. name is Lori Kovac. I am testifying in opposition of the proposed zoning changes, which will change the single-family zoning to multifamily zoning in the area east of Lone Fir Cemetery between 26th and 30th, Stark and Belmont. These changes are referred to in the comp plan as 930, 930 and 931. To clarify, I am not referring to the zoning on Belmont or Stark, but to the proposed currently zoned single family zoning between Belmont and Stark. Um, Amendment S21 proposes to allow the zoning to remain unchanged in the area immediately to the west of Lone Fir Cemetery. I would like that area covered by Amendment S21 to be extended to include the area of my concern immediately to the east of Lone First Cemetery between 26th and 30th Stark and Belmont. The zoning changes proposed in num number 930 and 931 affect a four by four block area, half in Sunnyside and half in Buckman. The comments I have heard from the planning staff in support of the zoning change are that the area has an existing mix of housing types and that there is a potential for affordable housing in this area. I think the residents of the area are being treated unfairly by the way these justifications are being implemented. The issues of a mix of housing types and a need for affordable housing are found throughout Buckman, Sunnyside, and Kearns. 
to pick one small four by four block area for a zoning change based on that reasoning is unfair and will cause significant harm to the current residents of our area who have invested a large part of their life savings in homes that are zoned single family with the understanding that the buildings that will be built around them will be a scale that is in keeping with the existing single family zoning. The proposed changes will allow currently conforming single family homes to have four story apartment buildings constructed immediately adjacent in a place where this could not happen at this point. Thank you, Lori. My name is Susan Whitney. I live in the Richmond neighborhood uh, on Southeast 47th, two houses south of Hawthorne. Despite the city's apparent wishes, we don't have any building sites in our neighborhood. We have a fully developed, sustainable neighborhood with single family residents, for the most part, were built over 100 years ago. My property is zoned R5 and is part of the proposed blanket upzoning to R2.5. I object to this upzoning on my house as well as all the other houses along Southeast uh, Division and Southeast Hawthorne that are just behind the commercial. I have no problem with the commercial on the main streets. That's where it should be. The only reason given for this rezoning, and I went to the neighborhood meeting and met with a planner who seemed very unfamiliar with our city, by the way. Um, the only reason is to bring it into conformance with the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan, by law, sets the maximum density, the maximum zoning for any particular area. That's fine, but there's nothing in the comp plan or Oregon law that says the actual zoning, zoning has to comply with the comp plan zoning. You can down zone as a legisl legislative action, as a blanket action. You can't up zone without giving homeowners such as myself and neighborhood people such as myself an, a notice, a hearing, and an opportunity to be heard in a quasi-judicial process. You can't do that. If you go back and read the current comprehensive plan, and this is all in my written testimony, it expressly states and cites to the Oregon laws and the Oregon cases that established that long established principle. My neighbors and I bought our houses and improved our houses. Thank you, Susan. Dominique? Hello, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Dominic Anaya, and I live in the Boise Elliott neighborhood. I'm here to um, oppose proposed change number 1471, amendment M42 to the comprehensive plan. In plain speak, that's the proposed zoning change of uh, some area of the North Fremont corridor from R1 to CM. Uh, I live right in the middle of this, and one of my main oppositions to this is just plain traffic in both the morning and the afternoons with the development going on already on Mississippi Avenue and the Vancouver Williams uh, corridor, uh, the street in front of my house is a parking lot. And this annoying situation becomes unsafe in the afternoon when the Boise Elliott School gets out. I've seen a number of cringeworthy near misses with children, not to mention numerous vehicle accidents and bicycle accidents with vehicles at the corner of Fremont and Williams. And this seems to be very against the city's uh, Vision Zero plan for traffic safety. Furthermore, there are already two subsidized housing units in this uh, zoning change proposal that I feel will be at risk. And at a time when the city is trying to get more affordable housing, just to put these subsidized housing units at risk seems irresponsible. One of the arguments in favor of this zoning change is to increase density in the neighborhood. But the fact of the matter is there's already room for a density increase with the R1 zoning, not to mention the development going on along both Mississippi and the Williams-Vancouver corridor already has 100, uh, 1,100 living units and over 50,000 square foot of commercial space that is unoccupied. So we are still growing, and I feel the zoning change right now would be somewhat ill-advised. 
thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dominic. Are there any questions? Yes, Andre. So can you explain um, the property on Fremont, um, the affordable housing, how that impacts the affordable housing? I'm not connecting and, and, CM and, would. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure myself how it would affect it. But it seems like uh, from my experience in my neighborhood, if there's room to redevelop, it's being taken. And so where there's already this affordable housing that's in R1 units, I can see the, the owners or someone nearby chomping at the bit to redevelop if they've got the option to bring in something that may be more profitable. Okay, I, so it's a replacement of the existing units? Correct. Okay. Correct. Thank you. I just have a quick question for Susan, because you were kind of outlining different portions of the code, and I, I appreciate your particular testimony about your property, but I guess just as a reminder that we are going through the process, I believe, that you just stated is required. I, I, I'm hoping you got noticed, and that's why you're here, and we are here listening to your testimony. This is a legislative hearing, not a quasi-judicial hearing. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Laura Menencino, Terry Parker, and Max Oxman. To start, or no? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Laura, and I'm here to talk about um, the proposed rezoning from R5 to R2.5 in the Piedmont neighborhood. It's two streets, North Kirby Avenue and North Borthwick. Um, I'm here to speak for the Piedmont Neighborhood Association because they had to leave, and also for my street, which is in that zone. If you go to those streets, you'll see that they are full with old, beautiful, well-built, well-maintained homes, so it's hard to imagine um, changing the zoning so that they could be replaced by something that's a lot cheaper. Um, even the apartment complex next door to me just got refurbished and they didn't add any new units or anything to it. Um, the only thing we can think of as a neighborhood is perhaps you're thinking because the north part is zoned R2 that we also belong with R2. but. Um, that was an open space redevelopment that we as a neighborhood were actually a part of. And it has uh, mixed use housing and it's been really successful. That's the only successful redevelopment in our neighborhood that has managed to retain diversity, um, provide affordable housing. Our neighborhood is getting very expensive and any redevelopment with multi-use uh, housing, so, sort of duplexes, I guess, is gonna be even more expensive. That's just what we see over and over again. I lost my great Section 8 um, neighbors in the apartment next door to me um, because they redeveloped and that's great, that's progress. And we are actually pro um, density on the street. A lot of us have built ADUs, which we rent way below the market rate. So I just think that it's an accident that we're being shoved into this uh, R2 zone that's north of us, which was a different situation because it was open. It was not a uh, developed property. Thank you, Laura. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Terry? Thank you. Uh, my name is Terry Parker. I am here today speaking as an individual to support the resolutions that were approved by my neighborhood association. Portland single family homes are under attack. Developers are demolishing affordable homes at an alarming rate. Upzoning related to the comp plan in single family no neighborhoods. Uh, virtually makes the dirt more expensive and the home standing on the dirt worthless. Will wall-to-wall -wall tenement warehouses, new, more costly houses that are wedged in, wedged in like sardines in a can and greed replace the more livable quality of life that retains modest homes with green yards and trees? Do we really need to destroy and obliterate the village to save it? This is what is being proposed in Rose City Park near the 60th Avenue Max Station. The large swath of properties between I-84 and Halsey Street from 57th to 63rd includes affordable starter homes, well-kept working class homes with modest yards, and a few multifamily structures 
consistent in scale with the homes. My neighborhood has suggested a modified change in the comp plan to add density, but also retain the existing R5 base zoning, except for non-conforming use properties that already have higher densities. In short, the neighborhood is not ready for mass change and wants a stronger voice in piecemeal change. One of the issues are the narrow four-foot sidewalks on 60th Avenue. Is there truly a need for 10, 10 to 12-foot supersized sidewalks when six to eight-foot sidewalks would be adequate? The neighborhood also wants to preserve historic homes and some character in the area. Furthermore, why should Rose City Park take a hit while more affluent neighborhoods like Lorehurst, which has a direct pedestrian connection over I-84 to the Hollywood Mac Station, and East Moreland near the Bybee Boulevard Mac Station have no proposed upzoning? This inconsistency reeks of inequality, borders on discrimination, and diminishes the opportunities for less than affluent classes of people to make an investment in home ownership. Rose City Park is asking for your support with a recommendation for maintaining the R5, uh, the existing R5 based zoning. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Max? Hey there, uh, my name is Max Oxman, and I live at 4049 Southeast Franklin Street. <laughs> And um, we're in a zone that's proposed to go from R5 to R2.5. Um, and uh, it's the entire uh, block, so it's our whole neighborhood. And um, I wanted to point out one thing that, you know, this public hearing is uh, during business hours on a weekday. So the testimonies that you're hearing before me and, you know, the ones that we fit in after, before the time runs out, we're speaking on behalf of a lot of folks um, that we don't want to get rezoned. And we have a few reasons, or I have, many, many reasons about it. Um, I've got an example. Um, my kids, I bring them to school in Selwood, and um, the same ex exact thing happened in Selwood where um, a property was zoned to R2.5. And um, these pictures are gonna be, you can't see them, but I can kind of describe them. Um, they're just uh, regular single family home houses. This is before. This was in um, uh, June 2014. And um, so there's this house and then um, another house here. And then if you fast forward to today, um, you have this exact same house right here, and it's completely um, overshadowed by this house. And it's not just one house, it's four. So it goes, um, there's the house from before, and it goes one now, new house, two new house, three new house, four new house. So what they did is they took one property, and then they shoved four houses onto it, and now it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty shameful, actually. If you go by there, um, it's located at 13th, uh, Southwest 13th, and um, um, sorry, Southeast 13th and Lambert. It's uh, 2010 Southeast Lambert and 2012, 2020, 2030, 2040. So four houses where there used to be one. And this is our 2.5, and this is what is being proposed for, for my house uh, and as well as our entire neighborhood. So um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, please don't rezone my house um, because it destroys the community. And if you want to see evidence of it, Selwood um, has it. Thank um, you, Max. Yeah. Thanks. Are there any questions? Oh, thank you. Bob Corey, Doug Klotz, and Sean Sullins. Okay. And so Alan Brown. Go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm Bob Corey. I own uh, two properties on the north side of Burnside on the Max Line. One is at 101861 East Burnside, and the other one is on next door to it adjacent, and it's on the corner of 109th and Burnside, and that address is 9 Northeast 109th. Uh, there are adjacent properties. The property on 109th that I own is on a corner, which is a plus for developing. Both of the lots are 10,000, approximately 10,580 square foot each. They're currently zoned for quite a few years at R2. And your notice proposes a change to the properties to R5. Which would, first of all, and I, I've talked to some of the neighbors in there, they feel exactly as I do, it's going to devalue the property if you can't put, this is right on the max line, the train goes by zoom zoom all day long and all night long. So they don't want to um, have it go to R5 from R2 
and it would devalue the properties, it would develop future development. The two lots west of my property, the same size as mine, have been sold to the National Urban and Economic Community Development Corporation. They are currently also zoned R2, and they are planning underway for developing low income on those lots, which are the same size as what I have. When the light rail was being proposed many years ago, I attended meetings at which time it was the consensus of the neighborhood didn't want the light rail because you'd lost your parking on Burnside and the noise of the max. So the city needed increased density, they said. And so ultimately the light rail was built. I was required to relinquish some, some footage at the front of my property, losing parking on Burnside, that was a plan to accommodate growth and population density in an area which has incurred. Thank now, you, Bob. I understand that it's David Douglas School District, but I please plead with you not to change it back, take it from R2 to R5. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Doug Klotz. I have one question if I could ask. Now, will we be getting more notices like on this July 12th or any of this stuff? or just in the mail of what the what the ultimate decision is going to be? I'll have Deborah clarify with you. Okay. She's coming up. She'll, she'll, she'll get you afterwards. Okay. Thank you. Very Doug Klotz. Um, I do live in the Richmond neighborhood, but I'm not speaking for anyone other than myself here. Uh, I do support all of the proposed upzoning in the zoning review areas. Um, increased access to transit and services in 20-minute neighborhoods to a larger population is critical to the working of the comp plan. Uh, the 1981 comp plan laid the groundwork for this uh, changes that are proposed here uh, from R25 to, to higher designations. Um, and now with the need for the comp plan performance standards, um, the housing crisis and climate change, um, it's time to upzone them. Uh, the impact on neighborhoods is not necessarily that dramatic. I mean, we've had all these areas already have had the comp plan designation for 30 years. There's not been a lot of row houses built. There's not been a lot of uh, changes made. Um, yeah, it'll be, it'll have some, but it won't won't be as dramatic as everyone has feared. Um, and also, we need to have our change to R25 to take advantage of what's coming up, hopefully in the uh, mixed use in the residential infill project, uh, where there's a, a sort of a, a matrix of changes that could be allowed in the R25 and changes allowed in the R5. So the R25 may mean something other than just you can do row houses. It may mean a lot of other things like two or three uh, ADUs. Um, it, there's a, having a, the R25 zone will have more advantages in the future than it has now. Um, as far as, especially as far as things that are more flexible to be used. You know, in other words, it's not just you have to split the lot and build two row houses, but you could do a duplex, a triplex, the other thing. I mean, it's still going to be determined, but um, there's Thank possibility you, for that. And um, I also, I do oppose the uh, downzoning of the Elliott Conservation District from R2 to R25. I think the R2 actually provides more flexibility to save the existing homes there. Great. Thank you. Alan? Good afternoon, Commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to address you. My name is Alan Brown, and I live at 1115 Northeast 60th Avenue in the Rose City Park neighborhood about two blocks north of the 60th Avenue Max station. I have come to address the issue of upzoning my area, bounded by Northeast Halsey on the north, I-84 on the south, Northeast 63rd on the east, and Northeast 57th on the west. I am asking the commission to uphold this decision five years ago not to upzone this area. On April 12, 2011, exactly five years ago, this commission held hearings on upzoning what was then called the 60th Avenue Station Community Project. This commission heard testimony but deferred a decision until your May 24th meeting. In the interim, you asked city staff questions which were answered and staff met with residents and the Land Use and Transportation Committee of our Neighborhood Association. On May 24th, you accepted additional testimony after which you commissioners debated the issue. Finally, the commission unanimously decided to send recommendations to the city council to not upzone our residential areas, 
approve commercial rezoning, add a design overlay zone through the station area, and emphasize to the City Council concerns about livability and traffic safety. So here we are five years later and not much has changed. We are the oldest section of Rose City Park and what was a 121 year old neighborhood is now 126 years old. Residents by and large still uh, oppose upzoning as does the Land Use and Transportation Committee as it did in 2011. With the exception of allowing for upzoning some higher density properties which are now non-conforming. So why are we here in 2016? Five years ago, you had a good process and arrived at a good decision. But now everything seems, for lack of a better term, shady. In my neighborhood, what started as an 11th hour change to the comprehensive plan suddenly morphed into an attempt to upzone the area without the process, communication, give and take, and debate we had in 2011, and apparently with no regard to the decision of this commission five years ago. Thank you, Alan. Just making eye contact. Thank you. <laughs> um, if anybody else would like to testify, just a reminder, please fill out a form and bring it here up to Julie. Our next uh, next up is Terry Griffiths and John Needing. Needig. Nidig. Okay. My name is Terry Griffiths. Um, I'm the co-chair of the Woodstock Neighborhood Association Land Use Committee. I live at 4128 Southeast Reedway. I have been before this commission before, and I have submitted testimony to say that the unimproved streets in our neighborhood are a very big issue. They all cluster around what is called the Woodstock Neighborhood Center, uh, which goes from Southeast 40th to Southeast 50th along Woodstock Boulevard. Uh, that area now is zoned or designated a neighborhood commercial uh, for one, one block either side of Woodstock. In the current residential and open space proposed draft, then the adjacent half block, or in other words, block and a half either side of Woodstock, is proposed to change from designated R25 to zoned R25. Um, we don't, in principle, object to the upzoning except that there is no consistent at all infrastructure to support it. And supportive infrastructure, in this case streets, was one of the criteria for upzoning designated R25 to R25. I submit a map, as I have submitted to this commission before, of the unimproved streets in the Woodstock neighborhood center. It's pretty impressive, I would say. <laughs> and we had a charrette to talk about the possible development of the Woodstock neighborhood center. We had a charrette, I think now it was a year and a half ago. And one of the things that was discussed, not opposition to more commercial, not opposition to more density, but how is that going to be supported with streets that were acceptable to the neighborhood? And the neighborhood... Thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you. My name is John Neidig. Is this on? Am I doing Doesn't that? sound like it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I own a duplex at 1814 and 1816 Southeast Inslee. Uh, the proposed change would uh, go from an R1 uh, to an R5. R1 would mean I can put a fourplex where there's a duplex at this point in time. Uh, R5 means that what I can do is, uh, if I rebuild, uh, go to a single family dwelling. Um, I, I pride myself in trying to uh, provide 
uh, affordable housing to uh, people, and I've owned this building for 22 years, something like that. I would like to expand to a fourplex, be able to uh, provide uh, affordable housing. Um, but uh, uh, And across the street, what has been permitted and is going to be going in is an 18-unit uh, building, three stories, six uh, units on each uh, floor. And um, it's, it's not a, a good mix to put a 16-unit apartment building and then a, a single family dwelling across the street. There are a number of, of uh, multi-family units um, on, uh, in this area and um, uh, I, I object to the, uh, uh, the proposed uh, changes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay, one last time for today. Is there anybody who would like to testify? If so, please fill out a form in the back of the room and bring them to Julie. Am I seeing somebody frantically filling out a form? Yeah, okay. James, you can come on up. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jim Gorder, and I live in the South Burlingame neighborhood at 8041 Southwest 8th. I was not intending to be here to testify, only to listen today, but I've seen, heard a couple of things that concern me. Uh, it seems that the rationale for making many of these zone changes is to conform the zoning to the comprehensive plan. Uh, many of the changes resulting in higher density. In what are, and my concern is that complete neighborhoods will only be, that are zoned for higher density will only incentivize the demolition of existing viable homes and their replacement with often larger, but definitely more instructive, more, more expensive, less affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I don't see anybody else frantically filling out a form. So with that, Deborah, could you come back up, please? And since you're coming back up, would you go ahead and clarify for everyone here if you're gonna send out more notices? Yes, I am happy to do that. Um, our plan for the composite zoning map would be to um, send out notices to people where there's a change to what's being proposed. So for example, if we make a zoning change to reflect or to um, incorporate a, a change of the city council decision for an amendment and that then um, results in a change of zoning, that would be something new we would then notify property owners, or if there's some other ch change for some reason where we're making some um, alteration to any of the zones that are, are different than what their original notice said in the proposal. So for people where we propose something here, for example, and the map proposal is getting carried forward exactly into the composite zoning map, we were not proposing to send out a new notice. We will try to do our best to let everybody know in, in various ways that there is a new hearing and another opportunity to provide feedback, but we weren't gonna send the legally required Measure 56 notice unless there's a change. And that's because this is actually gonna be a continued hearing um, from what you're doing today. But we do wanna let people know if there's something different that's suddenly on the table based on an earlier decision that they hadn't been notified of before. Perfect. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Deborah? Yes, Andre. So I just have um, Hollywood um, remind me, and maybe Chris, Michelle, you were here, I think, with Hollywood when we discussed that. The transportation issue was they were going to go after a Tiger grant to address the Tiger, the, the transportation issues. Um, that was part of our hesitancy, and I'm not sure where that ended up. In Hollywood or 60th? 60th. 60th. Uh, 60th, yeah, 60th, um, the transit station there. So my recollection is that um, it was 
we looked at a number of station areas east of Hollywood and the economic modeling didn't show enough potential activity to upzone the commercial was mm -hmm. the primary driver and that's why we sat on our hands at that point. And hopefully somebody else could confirm my memory. Yeah, I think we looked at, I wanna say five station areas yeah. and in some places, yeah, we found the market wasn't ripe for the kind of redevelopment that we've been looking at. With 60th, there was a lot of ta um, testimony at the time about the readiness of the area to be upzoned because some of the transportation improvements weren't in place. And what's different today than then was that a lot of the um, improvements that we had talked about are now in the TSP in the constrained list. Okay. Um, I do want to note that there have been a number of changes and discussions and back and forth about the plan for the 60th Avenue area and the neighborhood and um, has been working with staff and with the mayor's office and there's a, an amendment on the table at the council to reconfigure and come up with a new comp plan uh, proposal for the station area and the zoning um, uh, map would then follow and we have a proposal for that as well. I think I included in the mailing to you an amended um, map that shows a, a reconfigured zoning proposal that followed from when this uh, uh, proposal was first published. That continues to be a little bit of a moving target because we're not sure what will happen at council. So that is an area where you would see likely a new proposal that um, will be the product of a lot of back and forth conversations. Okay, and then can you remind us um, of the measure six notification and what measures residents have of that? Um, measure 56 of, notice. Yes. Yes. So that's a legally required notice that we send out at each phase, both at the comprehensive plan map phase and now at zoning to property owners to let them know that there's a proposed zone change that might affect their property. And so that's been a primary way of reaching property owners by letting them know not only that there is a change on the table that is being considered, but how they can uh, provide testimony. So it's a way to let them know about the time and date of the hearing and other ways they can provide testimony um, in addition to showing up at a public hearing. And we have been using those notices as way that the, the, what's required is a minimal information that says this, this may affect you. We've been using those as sort of communication vehicles to tell them a lot more information than what we're legally required to tell them, just because we're reaching so many households and so many properties, property owners, we might as well use that as an opportunity to tell them a lot more information. And can you tell them, well, I, I guess I was trying to get to, oh. um, it's the the zone change that potentially would affect their value of their property that requires the legal notice, correct? Right, although in, um, it, there's a lot of, um, yes, yes. Um, it, okay. The law says that with any comprehensive plan designation change, we would have to send them a notice, whether it's increasing value or decreasing, decreasing value. Yeah. Okay. And we're doing that for every zone change. We also have to send it to property owners where we have a code change that may affect how they can use their property even if the map doesn't change. So though through this, the other um, task five projects, the employment and so forth, there are some code changes that affect additional uh, property owners that aren't part of the map proposal. Okay, and then one last one, um, the Woodstock and unapproved neighborhoods, I'm familiar with that. Um, it, what is transportation's policy around the density and um, unapproved streets? Um, well, I can give you a quick answer. It's, it's, it's pretty nuanced, but in some locations, and I, I don't know um, what the conversation was in, in Woodstock, but um, in some locations, the addition of new development would actually trigger new improvements um, that wouldn't occur without development there. And so that may have been a place where um, PBOT staff and planning staff talked about where actually any new development would be required to improve the streets and that may be a good incentive to to see some of the improvements occur that wouldn't happen without that development occurring. Okay. Yeah. That was also um, what we heard from Peabot in 60th Avenue where it would actually be the development that would spur the, the improvements that otherwise wouldn't occur. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Eli. Um, maybe this is a, a request, I mean, I'm on the residential infill project and Doug Klotz alluded to this, that there's a, these are awkwardly co-timed processes um, in that um, neighbors will react against what's allowed by code today 
but the rules of the game are being rewritten right now. So I know you can't do anything about that, yes. but I think it might be helpful for our commission here. I think that's a good point. To, to hear, get, I know that even what the residential infill project is gonna recommend is moving target, but there is some downscaling of existing homes on the right. table. There is some more latitude to do what happens inside the envelope on the table, and what happens with skinny lots, which are very similar in concept to R5 versus R2.5. Um, so my hope is that um, maybe the commission, as we interweave our schedule, can get kind of an update of what's on the table there, because I think that may address some of the concerns that we're hearing in terms of the, the massiveness of homes getting built when that's part of the discussion that's going on in parallel. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. That's, that's a good addition. Any other comments or questions? Well, I have a question for you all. Um, as we move into your work session in two weeks, if there are any particular things you want us to prepare or bring, it would be helpful to know if there, were, if there was testimony that prompted questions for you where you'd like us to provide some additional information or consult with PBOD about something. Um, I, could, I could take some notes so that we could be best prepared for your deliberations when we come back to you in two weeks. I'm feeling like the heat of eyeballs on me. Chris, first. <laughs> <laughs> so there were uh, another piece of written testimony that um, characterized down zonings as takings. And I'm curious if we have any formal obligations under the various ballot measures around that topic, but we have to respond to that and or are subject to claims and how that fits into the whole picture. So you'd like us to come back and be able to respond to that? Yeah. If you could just explain how that all works. It would be helpful to me to understand what the city council is considering with the down zoning of East Moreland and how that relates to these other areas that aren't being down zoned because I don't understand at this point where the distinction is being made. Okay. So the effect, if they make that decision, if that's an amendment that passes what it might mean for other If we, I want to understand the criteria for the down zone that's being considered for East Moreland so I know how that plays out if I apply that filter to other neighborhoods because my memory here is that we had sort of criteria and we decided these are the ones we're upping, these are the ones we're downing. Mm -hmm. And if that has changed, then I think I need to understand how that percolates through these other zonings we're talking about. We haven't changed the criteria, just so you know that. We've kept the criteria the same, but we'll come back and walk you through it. Go ahead, Andre. Do a follow up. Um, so, East Moreland is particular because it seems that we've got a, a similar situation in the um, 60th Hollywood. And, and are those two similar in terms of criteria? So East Moreland and the 60th Hollywood district area in terms of criteria, would they would they fit the same criteria? No. Um we would, we would look at those areas. First of all, 60th is a station, station. area. It's, yeah. very, it's very specifically a, a very, you know, it's much more amenity rich area yeah. and it has certain um, characteristics because it's a transit station area and it has bus lines and so forth. So we would look at that area differently than a more residential area further from transit, further from services. But we don't have, through this um, project here, we don't have any areas that would fit the same criteria. As East Moreland? As East Moreland. No, um, okay. that was really, you know, when staff brought the, the, the issues to you and you, you had your deliberations about East Moreland and other areas, we were looking at places where the lots, the prevalent lot size already is a little bit larger. It varied, you know, okay. right around the 5,000 to 7,000 foot range. And the areas we're looking at in these zoning review areas that are the, um, part of what you're considering now, they tend to be smaller lots. Um, and different different characteristics. Any other questions? Um, so I just want to make sure as we're kind of wrapping up here that it's clear that the hearing for the zone map amendments is continued to July 12, 2016, and that we are going to be kind of making an initial recommendation on April 26. So my question tied to that, Deborah, is. Um, since there's been a lot of testimony in writing, mm -hmm. and especially since this was a, a hearing during the day, um, just kind of what's your process on compiling all of the testimony and kind of giving us recommendations or feedback on that testimony that we've received going into that? Okay. Um, and, we <laughs> and if you need more time to think about it, that's <laughs> totally appropriate well, as well. Well, of course, just we will We will have reviewed all the testimony um, that has come in to this point. 
And we would probably want to identify some themes or some common issues and, and maybe group some things in ways where you might be able to make some decisions so that if, you make, if, if you're thinking about this situation is this, then it would apply to these other um, pieces of testimony as well if people are looking at um, areas with characteristics in common. We'd probably want to group those for you so that you're not making decisions about each and every one. Um, and then, of course, we'd want to distinguish between the zoning map um, changes that are directly in conformance or correspond with, with the comp plan and those that are a little bit more um, isolated because they're these individual zoning review areas. And we, we are fully expecting that as we look at the testimony and we take another look at some of these zoning review areas, there may be places where we, we say, oh, OK, given this new information and given this um, uh, testimony that we've heard, we might have a different recommendation for you. So we're, we're willing to take a look right. at those based on what we've heard and what you've heard. And what's staff's process for feedback to, to the testimony you've gotten? Are you following up with people? Or in general, is it just more the discussion that we're going to hear around here? What's your it's, it's a little of both. I, have, um, I know that the, the district liaisons who've been the primary um, planners working on these zoning map amendments, a lot of them have had conversations with property owners or with neighborhoods and are, are, are having a lot more interaction. In other cases, they're just reviewing the written testimony that comes in without having the conversation. But there is some interaction, and they would be following up okay. where there's some questions or things that look like they're good points that we want to research further. OK, great. Good to hear. If there's nothing else, then we are adjourned. Oh. Okay. oh. Answer that kind of in general, and is there a way to find out in particular, in terms of the street grid? We could certainly yeah. follow up with with PBOT about where people have identified transportation questions. We we can follow up for you and have that as part of your discussion. Okay. That would be yeah, great. yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, Sorry, it we're is. adjourned. <laughs>